Good morning to all of you here, and welcome to those, uh, and probably good afternoon to all of those wherever you are in the world. I'm Stephanos Polizoides, uh, the Francis and Kathleen Rooney Dean of the School of Architecture uh, at Notre Dame, and I would like to welcome you to Walsh Hall, and a special welcome to all of you, and those of you joining us online. We are pleased to host this distinguished group of scholars. We're here to discuss this fascinating interdisciplinary research project collaboration between architecture and engineering to answer a long-standing question of the humanities, uh, the origin of the of Greek temple design. Funded by the University of Notre Dame through the Resilience and Recovery Grant Fund, this research project examines one of the most emblematic monuments of early Greek history, the so-called Tumba building in Lefkandi in, in Evia, Greece, built in the 10th century BC. Since this building was, was, was found and its reconstruction generated by J.J. Colton in 1993, has been presented in every book on Greek architecture as the earliest known antecedent of the, perip of the peripteral layout of, of later Greek temples. Colton's reconstruction has been subsequently challenged on structural grounds, and scholars are now divided between accepting or rejecting his, his hypothesis. The research team, led by Notre Dame's uh, Alessandro Piratini, has aimed to answer this question by conducting a comprehensive analysis of the building structure. Today, Alessandro and his team are going to present the preliminary results of this uh, uh, interdisciplinary project. Alessandro's research team, the Laboratory for the Interdisciplinary Study of Historical Architecture, is also new, having been formed in, 90, in 2020. It includes Notre Dame faculty from architecture, engineering, and uh, the arts and letters, as well as the Hesper Library and external collaborators, some of whom are present here today. ISHA's interdisciplinary work has the potential to answer big questions in relation to the history of architecture, as we're going to see in the presentations today. At the same time, it is important to know that ISHA's interdisciplinary research on historical structures and, and building methods also has the mm -hmm. potential to contribute new knowledge on traditional materials and methods, in, this, in the case of this project, adobe and thatch roof, uh, thatch roofing, that are still used in many areas of the world by a large proportion of the world's population, thus contributing to a key and better understanding of how these materials and methods can be used actively in the present and in the future. We're deeply honored to have the director of the Afghandi excavations, Professor Irini Lemos, who's participating through Zoom from the University of Oxford, as well as a panel of uh, distinguished scholars uh, also joining us uh, via Zoom. Uh, Donald Hagis, Department of Classics, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Lothra Haselberger, Professor Emeritus of the Department of Art History at the University of Pennsylvania. Sam Holtzman, uh, Department of Art and Archaeology at Princeton University. Nancy Klein, Department of Architecture at Texas A&M University. Andonis Kotsonas, Institute uh, for the Study of the Ancient World, New York University. Lena Lambrinou. Hellenic Ministry of Culture and Sports, Service for Restoration of the Acropolis Monuments Department, Annie uh, Onesorg, Department of Construction, History, Monument Preservation at the Technical University of Munich, Paul Scotton, Department of Classics at California State University, and Alainis van der Mortel, Department of Classics at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. It is now my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Professor Patricia Culligan. Matthew H. McCloskey, Dean of the College of Engineering, who will say a few words to you about her colleagues' contributions to this important work. Trish? <clears throat> Thank you, Stephanos, um, for the warm welcome and for hosting us here in Walsh Family Ball. I am very happy to be here to introduce the College of Engineering participants in ISHA's interdisciplinary research. The first engineering team involved is from Notre Dame's Department of Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering, and it includes research assistant professor Jean-Luca Blois, postdoctoral research associate Mitsuku 
Hasegawa, and Associate Professor Hirotaka Sakai, with the participation of Demetrius Baitanidis of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and Argonne National Laboratory. The aerospace team studied the effect of the wind on this ancient building, a factor that is critical to assessing its structural stability, considering the building's large roof and the strong winds of the Aegean coasts. A second team comes from our Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and Earth Science. This includes Jim Alleman, Director of the Master of Engineering program, uh, Professor Yaya Kurama, and Professor Brad Weldon, Director of Undergraduate Studies. They are joined by Liam Ubujada, a graduate student pursuing a Professor of Masters of Engineering here at Notre Dame, as well as a colleague from New Mexico State University, Professor Paolo Bandini. Together, the structural team has conducted a comprehensive finite element analysis of the building and will eventually tell us whether this building, as we imagine it, could stand or whether a slightly altered version of this reconstruction would need to be determined. In either case, this research will provide a significant contribution to our understanding of early Greek architecture. This research on historical structures and building methods is truly interdisciplinary. And with that comes the inherent challenge of communicating across disciplines which use different languages and methods, not only between architecture and engineering, but also within the various departments of the College of Engineering. Working together for a year and a half, the ISHA team has been successful in navigating the challenges of working across these different disciplines. They have developed an approach whereby progress is made through constant conversation and collaboration, learning from each other and from the context of each discipline in pursuit of a common result. For this conversation, new research questions emerge and a more comprehensive understanding of the problems can be achieved. As a result, the team has become more than a sum of its parts, extending the depth and breadth of their research and ensuring a thorough and comprehensive approach to the problems which they are faced and their potential solutions. The project, led by Alessandro Perrettini, creates a bridge between the disciplines of architecture, archaeology, and engineering, and strengthens the connection between the College of, of Engineering and the School of Architecture, as well as our various <coughs> partner institutes. I hope their work will encourage further collaboration between us in research and teaching in the future. Notre Dame and others are stronger when we collaborate within our university and with the profession at large. And when we extend that collaboration to include the partners um, that we are welcoming at these other institutes. Thank you for all of your work on this important topic. I look forward to learning more. Thank you, Trish. <clears throat> <clears throat> Hello, welcome uh, again, and uh, thank uh, the, uh, I'm Alessandro Viratini, first of all, for uh, those who uh, know me in, in person. And I'm here to introduce the program of this uh, colloquium, but first I would like again to thank Deans uh, Polizoides uh, and Callaghan for being here today. Your support means a lot to our uh, research. And also, I would like to give you, uh, our audience, a little more context on our research team, Isha Ladva. Now, Isha Ladva is a diverse research team of architects, engineers, scholars of antiquity, and experts of uh, 3D computer graphics that integrates knowledge and methods from various complementary disciplines to achieve a synthesis of approaches to the study historical architecture and built environments. Now, our activities include research on architectural monuments and complexes with an emphasis, in this case, on the ancient Mediterranean, as well as specific studies on historical design and construction methods with a view, as the Polizoides uh, was anticipating, to understanding how historical architecture adapted to climates and the environment in sustainable ways. Now, the Duma building is what brought us together in the first place. And I had started working on this uh, research project in uh, 2017 in partnership with uh, Jim Colton, my uh, mentor and, and friend. 
Now our goal was to re-examine the original reconstruction of this building after Georg Hirt raised important structural questions uh, and to determine whether the building could have a structurally functioning veranda, which is one of the, uh, the most significant uh, uh, aspects of this building, uh, if it really existed. Uh, now, after Jim Colton passed away two years ago, I invited colleagues and friends from other departments of Notre Dame, as well as other institutions, to join forces on this project. And they all accepted enthusiastically. Uh, we all we, we have come a long way from uh, those uh, initial conversations. And today I'm very happy to present the preliminary findings of our work in progress on the architecture of the Tumba building. We will begin with a talk by Irene Limos, who will introduce the Tumba building and its importance. Irene Limos is a professor of classical archaeology at the University of Oxford and the director of the Oxford University Excavations at Lefkandi. I owe her a huge debt of gratitude for her continued support to my research and lately to Isha's work. Next, it will be my turn to introduce the uh, open questions concerning the design and structure of this building. As we will see, our team is carrying out a comprehensive analysis of the structural capacity of the original reconstruction of the Tumba building, including, and importantly, wind loads. The two following sets of talks will then present the preliminary results of our fluid mechanics and structural engineering teams, respectively. Using technologies normally used in uh, aerospace research, the first team has determined the effects of wind loading on the Duma building. To do so, they have conducted wind tunnel experiments on scaled models and have then used exper the experimental data to produce a numerical model of the wind's impact on the building. Their work will be uh, presented today by uh, Gianluca Lois and Dimitrios Fitanidis. Uh, the structural engineering team will then show us the result of their finite element analysis of a portion of the building. Although the work is still in progress, they will be able to give us some preliminary answers to the questions as to whether the building, as Jim Colton reconstructed it, could stand. And in particular, if one of its most notable features the so-called veranda stands structural examination. They will also tell us about the next steps of their work, which will include experiments on mud brick or adobe masonry in partnership with the New Mexico State University. Their experimental data will not only help us refine our analysis of the Tumba building, but more broadly will help advance our knowledge of the structural behavior of adobe a building technology that is still used today by a large portion of the world's population. As I mentioned, as we contribute new knowledge on the design and construction of historical <coughs> architecture, we're so interested in how this knowledge can help us better design, assess, and preserve our buildings today. Finally, I will summarize our preliminary results and open up the discussion with our distinguished guests who are joining us remotely from uh, the US, UK, Greece, and Germany. Uh, for some of them, as I was saying, it is afternoon. For others, it's probably starting to dawn as we speak. And I uh, am deeply grateful to all of them for joining us today. And I look forward to their questions and comments at the end of this uh, uh, colloquium. Uh, by the way, uh, there's a, uh, an addition, and. Uh, uh, one more panelist, that uh, Professor Hans Georg Bankel, um, uh, in, and I welcome him uh, also to the, uh, the our distinguished group of panelists. Oh, one last thing, as Dean Culligan pointed out, one of the challenges of interdisciplinary research is understanding one another across disciplinary boundaries. So, if there are concepts uh, in this uh, along the way in the presentations or passages that you uh, would like to uh, ask for, to further explain or clarify, our speakers will be happy to take any questions during the panel discussion, questions from, from our 
uh, uh, in-person uh, uh, audience or from uh, the panelists or from Zoom. Mm. Now, uh, speaking of the, our Zoom audience, if you are watching us through Zoom, you are welcome to ask questions during the panel discussion using the Q&A function. And now, without further ado, I welcome to our virtual podium, Professor Irene Limos. Welcome, Irene. Thanks for uh, joining us today. Can you share me? Yes, yes. Okay, so, great. Thank you, Alessandro. As I was not able to uh, share my PowerPoint, I'm afraid I have to say next, so people at your end can change the slides. I'm sorry about that, but uh, this is what it is now. So it is uh, a great pleasure to be invited to this very important colloquium dedicated to the Tumba building at Lefkandi, and many thanks to Alessandro for organizing it. I had the fortune to excavate the building under the direction of the late Mervyn Popham when I was a student at Oxford. I also had the opportunity to dig together with Jim the post holes of the so-called veranda, especially those found outside and inside the now missing north wall and in the apse in the west. That was a challenging task as Jim was the most meticulous excavator a quality also found in both his research and published work. I remember well how he interrogated every single feature discovered while digging and before deciding what it was and what it meant. I'm not going to talk about the architectural details of the building as there will be others much better than me who will do so. And uh, of course, with the new research that has been achieved by Alessandro's team. I'm going to present you with a short reminder of what we know about the site. Next slide, please. Which might be useful, especially for those who are not familiar with the discoveries at Lefkandi, allowing us in some ways to contextualize the building in the region. Next thing. The tomb of building was on the top of a hillock which is located some 750 meters to the northwest of Xeropolis, the main settlement of Lefkandi. Seropolis was excavated in the 1960s by the British Kulatanthes under the direction of Mervyn Popham and Hugh Sykett, and more recently from 2003 to 2011 by myself and my teams. Next, please. The area excavated is less than one third of the whole tell, a fact that should be carefully considered before one makes any assumptions about the site during its long period of occupation. In fact, it's always interesting to see how surprised colleagues are by the size of the tell when they first visit Xeropolis today. The tell was occupied from the early Bronze Age to the late geometric period, so roughly from 2100 to around 700 BC. Thanks to our recent systematic excavations. Oops, sorry about that. I lost my text. So thanks to our recent excavation and efforts, Xeropolis was at last declared a zone A site, which means that it is protected by Greek law and never to be built in the future or cultivated. Next, please. The cemeteries were discovered, as I said, to the northwest of Xeropolis and were first excavated in the 1970s. The whole hill was occupied by cemeteries and six of them have been located, while five partly excavated by the British School at Athens in collaboration with the Greek Archaeological Service. One of them is the Tumba Cemetery. Tumba in modern Greek means mound, which must allude to that which covered the Tumba building. As you may know, the Tumba building was discovered when the owner of the land it occupies applied for a building permit. 
This meant that the local archaeological service had to investigate the plot before allowing any such activity. Next slide. The results of this investigation are reported in Lefkandi 2.2 by Peter Kaligas, the director at the time of the Greek Archaeological Service in Eubea. The trial trenches revealed the existence of a large building that invited further investigation. At the time, and even during the beginning of the systematic excavations, the building was called a naos, an incorrect assumption because of its large size. The discovery, however, of mostly protogeometric, in other words, uh, 10th century pottery associated with the walls exposed must have raised great interest since at the time, protogeometric structures were not known from the surrounding area or from Xeropolis, and no later finds were associated with the wall exposed in the trial trenches. Finally, fortunately, the surveyor of the BSA, the late David Smythe, planned what was discovered by the Greek Archaeological Service and estimated roughly the dimensions of the building. As we know, the owner of the land later in the same year and on the 15th of August, which is a religious national holiday in Greece, illegally bulldozed a large part of the central part of the building. It is however fortunate that the bulldozer missed the burial sites by a few centimeters. Next slide, please. The discovery of such exceptional barriers in the central part of the building during the systematic excavation of 1981 has since raised a great deal of interest for both the public and the specialists. It has also opened the debate regarding the function of such a monumental for the period structure. In any case, after the illegal bulldozing, the Greek Ministry of Culture invited the British School at Athens to collaborate in the excavation of the plot. Excavations of the building took place from 1981 to 1983, while we also continued digging in the area until 1994 to expose the remaining burials to the Tumba Cemetery located to the east of the building. Next, please. I often think how remarkable that is after such misfortunate events, which have destroyed so much of this remarkable building, but we still have managed to have so much information about its constructions and some of the furniture discovered in it, allowing Jim Fulton to publish it in such details. What I would also like to remind us is the sequences of events in the biography of the building that have been established after the excavations and which have been, in my view, clearly described by Mervyn Popham. Indeed, the excavations revealed that the building was not in use for a long time and that after its abandonment, it was covered by a mound. Next slide, please. The material used to raise the mound must have been brought from elsewhere and contained a lot of pottery, which has been dated to around 950 BC. The scale of such an operation was great and must have involved the whole community. I believe that Jim Coulton estimated that roughly 2,000 man days would have been required to fill in the building. Another important question is that regarding the reason that the building was abandoned and filled in. Next, please. Perhaps Alessandro and his colleagues um, could provide some answers to these questions. Popham thought that a possibility could have been that an earthquake affected the building which collapsed. For certain, and as the excavations noted, some of the internal decoration of the building may not have been accomplished. For example, the plastering of the central room was not completed and the staircase was most probably also unfinished. In 2002, I suggested that the building was deliberately destroyed as another act of what I described a conspicuous destruction that characterized the funerary rites of the Tumba Cemetery. But of course, this is far from certain and I'm prepared to change my mind if other suggestions are forthcoming regarding the collapse of the building. In any case, very soon after the recovery of the building, the local community started to bury its more prominent members at its east end for another 125 years. 
Next, please. And next, just a moment, because I think we need the next one as well. Yes, thank you. The remarkable funerary rites given to those buried in the building and those at the cemetery have changed our views about the whole period. But it has also raised debates about what the faction of the Tumba building was. There are two main theories. One was advanced soon after the first preliminary reports reached the academic community, but before the final and meticulous publication by Popham and Coulton. The argument is that the building was the dueling of a local dignitary who after his death was buried together with his consort in the middle of it. The excavators, however, strongly believe that this was a funerary building and that the burials took place first and before the construction of the building. Next slide, please. They base their arguments on the discovery of evidence associated with the cremation of the male burial discovered under the traces of the floor of the building and in proximity to the burial shaft. Jim Coulton also noticed that if the central post of the building had had the expected spacing, one post should have been in the south burial shaft that contained the human burials. So, if the shaft was dug after the building was erected, then this would have brought the roof down. In addition, the patches of decayed thatch found in the area over the grave suggest that the roof came down later after the shafts were refilled. Again, it will be interesting to hear whether more recent observations by our colleagues here could add more to this debate. I have also argued that the proximity of the building to the cemeteries, and especially to the early cemeteries of Skubris, Haliotis, and Palia Pelivoria, does not make it an ideal location for a residential building to be erected that close to burial grounds where the most common rite was cremation. On the other hand, the location of the tumba on the highest point of the hillock that was dedicated to the cemeteries was probably chosen as the burial ground of an exceptional man and his offerings. It has also become apparent that the more recent excavation on Xeropolis have produced remains contemporary to the Tuba building, indicating that the settlement was located there as it was in earlier and later periods. In fact, that was one of the reasons I went back to excavate the settlement of the site to find perhaps more early Iron Age buildings. Unfortunately, on, although there is good evidence of early Iron Age finds, the heavily eroded tell of Xeropolis did not preserve any structures of the period, but mostly fragmentary walls and deposits, as well as remains of another late geometric house. However, the earlier phases of the occupation of the site have produced a structure that is construction displays long established building traditions at Lefkandi. Next slide, please. You see far. Next, please. During one of Jim's and Mary's visits uh, at uh, Lefkandi, and when we are digging this particular building, Jim thought, as I did at the time, that its construction reminded us that of the Tumba building. Excavations, however, revealed that the building on Xeropolis was much earlier. Next slide, please. It is in fact dated to another prosperous period for the site, and that is the 12th century BC, also known to the specialists as Little Attic 3C. We, ca we call this building Building M, and Building M had several phases and subphases of use. In the 12th century, there were two main periods of occupation, each with subphases. The area, however, was also inhabited in earlier periods as buildings were revealed below M1. What is interesting is that these earlier buildings had both a different orientation and plan for M1, as it's clear from the aerial photograph where they are marked with a red dotted line. Next, please. Next, please. 
In the first phase of M1 and to the east of the building, a large tomb room, the northeastern room was constructed and was part of the same complex. The building was equipped with a lot of good quality ceramics and coarse wares for storage and preparation of foods. There were also large beads, beads used for storage of dry food. These are marked on the plan in black. And on the other hand, the smaller cycles, cycles indicated post holes, which must have supported wooden posts that divided internally the space of the main room. In the northern end of the main room was found an elaborated hearth. Can we have this, the next one, please? The preserved dimension of the main room of the building are about 10 to six meters, while that of the northeastern room are five by four meters. The building with its new orientation and plan is dated based on the study of the ceramics to Lefkandi phase 2A, which corresponds with late Elavic 3C middle, roughly from around 1150 to 1100 BC, so sometime in the middle of the 12th century. In the second phase of the building, phase M1A2, next slide please, the northeastern room came out of use and covered with a yellow clay deposit, as were parts of the main building, marked in yellow on the slide. During this phase, clay beans discovered in the main building were used for storage, while the hearth continued to be also in use. At the end of this phase, leveling material covered build M1A and prepared the area for the construction of building M1B. Next slide, slide please. During the same period of the building, M1B, a long and narrow room was also built to the southeast side of the main building, which is called the annex. The use of building one, uh, M1B has three subfaces and uh, that were mostly traced in the main room and in the so-called annex. According to the ceramics associated with the construction of the first phase, the building is dated to the transition of the Kandi phase 2A to 2B, which is roughly at the end of the 12th century. However, the later use of the area during the early Iron Age has disturbed parts of the building and makes it hard to reconstruct the complete area that M1B occupied in the end of the 12th century. Next slide, please. Noticeably is the cutting of a huge pit, we call it pit 13, during the late 9th century, which has destroyed most of the southeast part of the area. Nevertheless, the ceramics found associated with the two next subfaces of the building and the annex correspond with the transition from the late Bronze Age to the sub mycenaean period. According to the conventional chronology, this period covers the middle to the late 11th century, roughly around 1050 to 1025 BC. It is noticeable that the character of the deposits indicates that the transition from the one subface to the other were short-lived and must have corresponded with brief periods, with brief periods of time. Next, please. The next building that occupied the area was M2, which is poorly preserved because of the extensive use of the area in the later periods and the erosion that has affected the whole of the tell. Yet M2 is dated to the protogeometric period. Later periods are also represented in the area with remains of walls that belong to structures dated to the geometric and geometric periods, in other words, to the 9th and the 8th centuries until the ab abandonment of the whole tell. Next, please. Building M offers then evidence for a large structure with a north to south orientation. It was constructed with the lower parts of the walls consisted of stone circles, while above them, it was built with mud bricks. In the first building phase, there is some evidence for a central post, but that will be confirmed by the detailed study of the architecture. I don't think, of course, that building M had an upsidal end, although we don't have its north end, which was lost by later structures and the erosion at the edge of the tell. This building is not unique. Several 12th century houses have been excavated and none of them has an upside that end apart from those found on the tell in the Tumba Thessaloniki dated roughly to the same period. Next please. And this is a reconstruction uh, of uh, showing one of these large buildings with an upside uh, end. Uh, 
I have suggested in the past that the Apsilter plan might have come from the north, and I think the late Bate Wells has suggested that as well. And I wonder what other people think about that as well. Next, please. In any case, 12th century structures have been discovered in Tiryns and Aegira in the Peloponnese, Mitru, Kinus, and Eleon in central Greece, and Carfi, Halasmenos, Castro, and Vronda, Cavusi in Crete. Those in the mainland follow similar traditions with Lefkandi in building such structures, while in Crete there are differences, as Donald Huggies and other colleagues in the panel have shown with their excavations and studies on the island. At present, however, we don't have uh, much evidence of uh, we don't have much evidence considering the following centuries and especially the 11th century. Next, please. One exception must be Megaron B at Thermos, which has now been dated to the late 11th century and uh, which was an impressive structure that occupied some 156, uh, uh, 156 square meters. I believe, however, that the lack of buildings at other sites should, could be accidental. Stop here and make, I make this parenthesis because uh, I would like to stress that the ability of building complex structures did not die with the demise of the palaces. It is also important to observe that on tells, constructions on top of earlier and reused structures, as in the case of Xeropolis, could conserve building traditions that were not discontinued in the transition from the late bronze to the early iron age. Next, although building M in the 12th century is an adequate structure, it cannot be compared to the monumental funerary building at Tumba, which clearly demonstrates the potential of ambitious architectural constructions in the 10th century. Other freestanding edifices, mostly upsidal in plan, were smaller. Next, Nihoria Unit 4 1 was uh, 73.5 73, square meters in phase one and 127 square meters in phase two. Another building, Unit 4 5, is estimated to have been larger, around 111 square meters. The larger building, Satasini, was around 71. Uh, square meters, while the building at Kefalos in Thessaly, a new building that we know now, was 52.4 uh, square meters. So the size of the buildings uh, varies depending on location, context, and faction. The remarkable size of the Tumba building could also suggest its exceptional role in the funerary rites. Next, please. Finally, what I perhaps I would like to suggest is that the Tumba building, even if it did not inspire later domestic architectures, we may agree that had an impact on the cult buildings as those of the 8th century Eretria and the recently discovered now 7th century uh, temple at Amarinthos. Discussions are debated Debates uh, according, uh, the, uh, concerning the Tumba building will continue. And I'm certain that your deliberations today will advance our understanding of such an extraordinary construction. Well, I hope my summary will help to set the site and its building in context, locally and regionally. And I look forward to hearing the main presentation of the colloquium. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Irene. This was a perfect <clears throat> introduction, as a matter of fact, to our project. And I will now delve into the architectural features of the building and introduce the main points of our research. So uh, after the, its discovery in the 1980s, the Tumba building became pretty well known as a significant building for the history of Greek architecture. Following Jim Colton's initial reconstruction, which includes a U-shaped veranda of wooden posts, the Tumba building was widely recognized, as I said, as the earliest known local antecedent of the peristyle of later Greek temples. Now, Colton's uh, peripteral reconstruction went unchallenged until uh, 2015, 
uh, when Georg Hertz questioned it on a structural grounds and proposed a non peripteral alternative. Now, subsequent studies have therefore been divided with some retaining Colton's peripteral reconstruction and others rejecting it as structurally questionable. Interestingly, if you uh, look up the Tumba building on Wikipedia, you find it uh, described uh, that this reconstruction uh, qualified as structurally questionable. <laughs> In this talk, I will prepare the ground for my colleague's analysis by doing three things. First, I will outline the evidence and the rationales behind the two alternative reconstructions. Second, I will identify some crucial and critical flaws in Hertz's reconstruction in line of argument. And third, I will present a preliminary assessment of uh, Jim Colton's reconstruction and formulate the main questions that led to our research, as well as explain why addressing these questions requires a comprehensive structural analysis <clears throat> and consideration of wind forces. Now, built in the first half of the 10th century BC, the Tuva building is the largest apsidal building so far known from early Iron Age Greece, with its walled body measuring about 10 by 45 meters. Although the western end is missing and the middle part, as Professor Irene mentioned, was destroyed by illegal bulldozing, the plan of the building can be reconstructed on the basis of the position of extant host pits, storage pits, and the preserved stone socle, which rises up to 1.3 meters high and at several places still supports courses of mud bricks. But the building had a shallow porch before an open fronted room, leading into a main central room in which the major burial was found, containing the cremated remains of a man and the inhumed uh, remains of a woman in one pit, and the remains of four horses in another. Two small square rooms flanking a passage separated the main room from the apse. As is typical in thatch roofed early Iron Age Greek buildings, a row of wooden posts along the building's longitudinal central axis supported the, the roof ridge. Additional rows of uh, post pits interestingly, show that there were other posts that abutted the interior face of the walls and were also and posts were also located outside at the distance of about 1.8 meters from the walls. Now the posts were inserted in pre-dug pits. They were refilled around the posts' bases. Although the wood did not survive, in many cases the compacted filling preserves the imprints of the posts, showing three things. First, that the central posts had a circular cross section, uh, 18 to 20 centimeters in diameter. Second, that the wall posts and exterior posts had a rectangular cross section, 6 to 10 by 20 to 30 centimeters. And third, that all posts were vertical. The bits also show that the wall posts and exterior posts consistently aligned crosswise. Now, on these grounds, Jim Colton hypothesized that the exterior posts constituted part of a veranda anchored to the wall posts. A vertical impression in an earth ramp used to build the mound shows that the exterior posts were at least 1.2 meters high. Now, given evidence of a doorway in the southern wall, Jim Colton defined the minimum height of these posts to be 1.5 meters, just enough, and I quote, to pass under the eaves of the veranda to go in and out of the building, end quote. The building's absidal plan and fragments of the vegetable, of vegetable materials on the floor indicate a thatched roof. The slope of the roof remains conjectural, but on the basis of vernacular traditions using thatch, Jinko assumed a pitch of about 45 degrees. Now, with the slope in raised 1.5 meters above the ground, the building would have reached over 8.75 meters high at the ridge, with the axial posts about 8.5 meters high. Colton's reconstruction was widely accepted 
the existence of the surrounding veranda, as I said, meant that the building was recognized as the earliest known antecedent to the peripteral layout of uh, later Greek temples. But in 2015, Georg Hirt re-examined Jim Colton's reconstruction and rejected it as structurally impossible. Now, Georg Hirt claimed that one of the central posts, C4, here in the uh, illustration, with a lower diameter at ground level of only 18 centimeters in a height of about eight and a half meters would be too thin and tall to withstand the roof's load. The main risk for such a tall and thin post would have been failure by buckling, which is sideways bowing under compression. To avoid this risk, Georg Hebb concluded that the height of the eaves must be lower and the roof with narrower, with the outer post constituting a fence rather than a veranda. Now, as Herd pointed out, the maximum load that a long slender column with a uniform cross section can withstand without buckling is calculated by an equation derived by the 18th century mathematician Leonhard Euler, in which PCR, here shown on the top left, is the critical buckling load and is a function of uh, several uh, factors. Uh, we will go over some of the other factors in short, but suffice it to say that one of the most impactful factors here in red type is L, which is the length of the column of the post in our case, because the critical button load varies with the inverse of its square. Herd's new reconstruction reduces the length of the post to about 7.5 meters, and thus reduces the tendency to buckle by half. Now, Georg Herd raised some very important questions that the original study had not considered. And yet, both his alternative reconstruction and his line of argument present some problems that, in my opinion, invalidate his conclusions. To begin, the idea that the exterior posts had the fence it does not really account for the alignment uh, between wall posts and exterior posts. Now, this alignment occurs very consistently along the length of the building, despite the greatly irregular longitudinal spacing of the posts. Now, this cannot be casually dismissed or simply attributed to <coughs> the use of a consistent design unit. The alignment thus suggests, in my opinion, at least a connection between the posts, a direct connection. Now, there is a spectrum of possible variations. It would significantly lower the height of the Tumba building without depriving it of its veranda. One would involve lowering the pitch, as shown in, uh, in this illustration that Ene Onesorg kindly sent to me a few days ago. Now, thatched roofs are typically steep, but pitch varies with the thickness in, of the thatched coat. And in dry areas of the, the Mediterranean, there are examples of temporary sheds roofed with a thin coat of straw that is uh, with a pitch that can be lower than 45 degrees. Now, while this is possible, uh, Jim Colden now chose not to pursue this alternative idea because mainly because early Greek uh, votive models reproducing thatched buildings consistently show steep roofs, very steep roofs, and so too do modern Greek shepherds' dwellings, as the ones in the images here. Now, other possible variations include lowering the pitch only above the, ver the veranda, or without altering the pitch, assuming that the building had cross beams attached to the central posts. Uh, much like, for example, in the traditional communal houses of Fiji, um, by increasing the stiffness of the structure, cross beams placed on top of the wall um, would have reduced the post's tendency to buckle by up to four times. Now, these are all possibilities. Although each implies uh, modifications, in the additions to the original reconstruction, which either deviate from the evidence or for which, alas, there is no evidence. 
Now, in short, the above alternatives, while, while all possible, are less economical than the original reconstruction in terms of the number of assumptions they imply. And therefore, whether, rather than espousing one of these alternatives, I instead uh, begin by making a preliminary structural reassessment of the original reconstruction and found out that its structural capacity was considerably higher than Georg Herr thought. Now, first, I calculated the imposed load, which Herr estimated in the order of two tons, assuming a thatch weight of about 70 kilograms per square meter. Each central post carried about 20 square meters of roof, which comprised thatch, battens, rafters, and ridge beams. A review of pre-industrial construction manuals and ethnographical sources shows that there is no universal weight for thatched roofing. It may arise from different standards for thatch thickness, different materials used, different safety factors allowed for, or different expectations of water absorption after prolonged rain. Now, at the low end of possible weights are the roofs of the huts of the Sarakatsani, pastoralists of central and northern Greece, with coats of straw and rushes only 10 to 15 centimeters thick and weighing 15 to 20 kilograms per square meter. In the middle are the 30 centimeter thick coats of straw that are common across central Europe in weight 25 to 40 or 45 kilograms per square meter, including the battens to which thatch is secured. At the high end are reeds weighing 45 to 70 kilograms per square meter for a 30 centimeter thick coat. Now, if you multiply these figures by 20 square meters, the tributary area of uh, the post uh, C4, each axial post would have carried a load ranging from 300 to 1,400 kilograms. And to this, we must add the weight of suitably sized ridge beams and rafters, which Jim Colton estimated to be about 420 kilograms, which means overall a load of seven, uh, 720 to 1,820 kilograms on each post. The second step was calculating the post's critical vacuum load, which is the load uh, below which, uh, the axial load below which the post, the column, is structurally sound. And this depends on the material, the geometry, and the end conditions of the post. Although Georg Herr did not present his results, he did mention the reference figures he used. And these figures and the application of Euler's uh, formula to this particular case are highly problematic for the reasons that I will illustrate in short. In Euler's equation, one of the factors affecting the bucking load is E, the modulus of elasticity mm -hmm. of the material. Georg Herr assumed a low modulus of elasticity of about of 8,000 megapascal, claiming that a post as thin to C4 that must have uh, been uh, cut from a young tree that had not yet developed its full mechanical properties. Now, fir was the tree that the Greeks most commonly used in architecture and shipbuilding, and abies kephalonica, uh, Greek fir, is endemic to Euboea. Now, considering the thickness of the bark, the diameter of breast height of the tree from which C4 was obtained, would have been no less than 20 centimeters, uh, which most fur species reach around the age of 40. Now, industrial tree farms in the US harvest Douglas fir around, uh, Douglas fir is not uh, Abias kephalonica, of course, uh, 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 around 40 years of age. When the modulus of elasticity of the wood after, after drying, is uh, well above 13,000 megapascal, well above 8,000, as uh, Georg hypothesized. But most importantly, the end conditions Herd considered represent a considerably more adverse scenario 
Then the post's actual conditions. Besides length, <coughs> the other most impactful, impactful factor in Euler's equation is k, which accounts for the column's end condition, that is, depends on whether the two ends are fixed, <coughs> inched, or free. Georg had considered the post as being fixed at the base, but completely free to move at the top, which corresponds to k equal to 2 in Euler's formula. Now, this is one of the worst possible conditions for an axially loaded column. In all likelihood, the top of the post was fastened to the ridge beams, which in turn were fastened to the rafters, as is typical in touched huts to this day. Uh, to some extent, such connections would have, uh, pre what could prevent lateral movements at the top of the post. Uh, if the top of the post was unable to move, the corresponding k value should not be 2, but 0 0.7, because buckling risk decreases exponentially with the second power of k. This reduces the risk of buckling by over 80%. Now, using Euler's formula with a revised modulus of elasticity, I calculated how the critical buckling load changes as the value of k here on the horizontal axis varies. It must also be noted that Euler's formula applies only to straight columns, whereas our posts favor since uh, they were obtained from trees. In my preliminary calculation, I therefore used a, I, I used a theoretical cross section with a diameter with a top di uh, diameter of thirteen point five centimeters. Now, this purely theoretical cross section is the mean of the base and top diameters, with the top diameter being a rough estimate taper for most fur species. As Liam Abu Jadev's uh, structural uh, analysis will show, this is a conservative approximation uh, because it, a tapered post, as we will see, is less prone to buckling than one with a diameter equal to the mean of top and bottom diameters. The descending blue line in the chart here represents the critical buckling load. The three horizontal line, red lines, represent three different load conditions. The first two lines from the top correspond to 30 centimeter thick coats of reeds in straw, weighting 70 and 40 uh, kilograms per square meter, respectively. Now, these two coats follow the modern thatching standards for heavy precipitation regions in northern and central Europe. The bottom line corresponds to a thinner coat uh, of straw, weighing about 15 kilograms per square meter, common for the houses of the Saracatsani pastoralists of Greece, and suitable for climates with a lower precipitation regime. Now here, the intervals of K, where the blue line is above the red line, mean that the, structural, the structure is sound in that particular load condition. As the chart shows, even in the worst case scenario, the heavy thick coat of reeds considered by Georg Hill, the imposed load is still lower than the critical bucking load for values of k up to about 1.2. For the other two loading conditions, the structure is sound up to values of k equal to 1.4 and about 1.8 respectively. But the question is, how can we determine the precise value of k in our case? In other words, to what extent exactly could the structure of the tumba building prevent the top of post C4 from moving? Now, to answer this question, Ishalab has conducted a comprehensive structural analysis of a portion of the building around its weakest point, post C4. Is shown above a crucial factor in assessing the structure against buckling was whether or not the top of the post could move laterally and the sideways forces produced by wind on the top of, uh, of, of the roof could have seriously affected the post's stability. Ishalab has quantified both wind and gravity loads 
and has examined their combined effects in two stages. The first stage has involved wind gallery experiments and uh, scale models. As we will see, these experiments, together with numerical simulations, have enabled us to estimate the wind pressures on the building. In the second stage, wind pressures have been computed together with gravity loads in a finite element structural analysis of the building. This analysis will confirm that the peripheral reconstruction is structurally sound. In addition, it will elucidate how aspects of the building's design related to structural needs. And I now welcome to the podium my colleague and friend Gianluca Blois, who will introduce the wind analysis. Gianluca, please. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Gianluca uh, Blois, and uh, I I've been uh, leading uh, the free mechanic team on this project. Uh, today, I'm going to give you a brief summary of uh, the wind analysis uh, we conducted on the Tumba building. Can you look a little louder? If you louder? Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, as you can imagine, this is going to be a little bit different from what we have seen so far. I'm going to be using some uh, terms that you may not be familiar with. Uh, uh, try to explain things as clear as possible. And uh, if something is not fully clear, I'm more than happy to take questions uh, during the discussion section. So first of all, let me introduce the, uh, the fluid team. Uh, first of all, here, uh, Mitsu Hasegawa. Uh, he's a postdoc here in Notre Dame, and he is the one who conducted the uh, experiments. Uh, then we have uh, Dimitris uh, Fitanidis. Uh, is a, a, a joint faculty at the uh, University of Illinois, and he uh, performed the numerical simulation. He's gonna uh, present that work. Uh, then we have uh, Adam Kitt. Uh, he um, assisted with the 3D printing fabrication of the models. And finally, uh, Hirotaka Sakawa and myself coordinated uh, the team. So first of all, uh, let me give you a little bit of an overview of what I'm going to show. This presentation, the, the wind analysis is divided in uh, four parts. I'm going to present part one and part two, and then uh, Dr. Fitadinis is going to present part three and uh, give you a summary. Uh, in part one, I'll, I'll just give you a rationale of how we approach the problem and uh, uh, so the methods we used. In part two, I'll, I'll be presenting the, exper uh, the experience of results, and uh, in part four, I'll try to wrap up uh, our, the work and try to explain how we use the results. So first of all, the very objective uh, of the project is illustrated uh, below, and uh, essentially is to determine uh, what the total building could withstand uh, in terms of uh, wind loads. Um, so, it, it is important to emphasize that within this context, the wind analysis served uh, merely as a support to the structural analysis. So essentially what we did is to try to estimate as best as we can the wind loads and then pass that value to the structural team. So now, uh, why is wind important? Uh, give you some reason here, you can see uh, uh, essentially, uh, wind load uh, it's, uh, can cause uh, structural damage, can cause structural damage partial. This is uh, illustrated by the uplift of the roof, for example, that could happen in the tuba building. Uh, but in some extreme cases, it could bring to the collapse. And so a, a thorough analysis can serve to identify what sort of damage uh, could have uh, occurred in the tuba building. So I, I want to emphasize that the reconstruction of these forces is very, very uh, challenging, both experimental and numerical. And uh, uh, especially uh, in, a, in a case in which you don't have a lot of information, like in the case it's mostly reconstructed. Um, so in, in the case of the tubal building, most of the uh, information like the wind, uh, intensity, direction, and even the shape, which are really important to the construction of the wind load, is uh, um, essentially all, all could be um, so reconstructed, it's kind of controversial, let's say. Uh, we don't know the exact shape, we don't know how much the prevailing wind, 
uh, characteristics were. Um, so we have to make uh, assumptions. And uh, one of the goal in this analysis was to identify the worst case scenario. So it's not to identify what was uh, the Tula building exactly uh, outstanding, but most kind of um, provide a parametric analysis of, uh, of the wind of several conditions, essentially. Uh, so here is a, a, an example taken from a recent uh, paper published in which uh, they try to uh, reconstruct the pressure distribution on an idealized building. Um, on the left, you can see a side view, a uh, cross section of uh, this idealized building. And on the right side, you see a top view. <clears throat> so uh, what you see that these vectors represent the pressure at each position on the surface of the building. Uh, you can see how the pressure varies in intensity, uh, but more importantly in sign. And you can see the here the vector pointing into the building are positive, which means that the, uh, the wind is pushing, and the one. Uh, here, the, the, the arrows pointing away from the building are negative, which means it's, a, it's a, an exerting suction on that wall. <clears throat> now, let, let's focus on the, uh, on the side view. Uh, you can see that these pressures are uh, only, uh, they, they change in space, but uh, they're, they're also uh, very complex to, um, well, we would say they're, they're very complex to uh, estimate. <clears throat> so what we think you can do if you're able to reconstruct this pressure is to uh, integrate them and obtain the total force, which is here represented by that black, black arrow. Okay, uh, so the, the, the total force, of course, as I mentioned before, depends on the many, many parameters, the most important of which are the shape of the building uh, and the characteristics of the flow, mostly the wind intensity and the direction of the flow in, in relation to the building itself. Uh, now, as I mentioned, I, I want to stress this notion is that, uh, so first of all, the, the reconstruction of the pressure is very, very challenging, uh, even if you have all this information. And in the case of the Tumba building, uh, we lack most of the information. So in, in our approach, we have to make a series of assumptions here, at least three of the main assumptions. Uh, the first one is that we consider a roof beach from the original reconstruction, which is the one that 45 degrees. The second assumption is that uh, for um, the, the, the wind direction compared to the building, uh, we consider 3, 1, here representing in this slide is uh, the zero, so you align with the axis of the building, 45 degree and 90. And one of the first objective of this analysis was to identify the worst case scenario, which we assume to be 90 degree, but uh, I'm going to try to show you that uh, we confirmed the right policy. Uh, the other assumption is that we don't know the wind intensity, so the, in our approach, we try to uh, provide a parametric analysis. This, this will be shown in much better details by the structure analysis, in which essentially you uh, assume a series of velocities of the wind and uh, calculate the different wind loads. Uh, and on this end, what we did, we, uh, we tried to characterize this coefficient here, it's called the drag coefficient, uh, that allows you to uh, compute the force uh, acting on the building. Okay, so uh, the approach we follow, of course, we cannot measure the, uh, the wind around the building. It has to be a modeling approach. Uh, there are a couple of different ways to approach this problem. Uh, the one we chose is to use uh, two methods. The first one is the experimental analysis of the flow which is represented here on the left. And the second one is a numerical analysis. Uh, why did we choose these two? So uh, they, uh, each one of them has pros and cons. Uh, the, the experimental analysis uh, is very accurate in reconstructing the flow distribution of the building. Uh, however, it's very, it would be very extremely challenging to reconstruct the uh, pressure distribution on the surface, okay? 
So what we decide to do is to run some uh, simplified numerical models, which are uh, able to obtain to reconstruct both the floor on the building and all the the pressure uh, on the entire surface of the building. The problem with these numerical uh, simulations is that to be reliable, they need to be experiments. Okay, and so essentially the experiments I'm going to show you today are in support essentially for the numerical analysis. And so this uh, concludes the, the first part, which was introductory uh, of the wind analysis. I'm going to now show you uh, the experimental analysis here. So th uh, this photo shows the uh, wind tunnel we utilized for this work. Uh, the facility is a part of the aerospace laboratory at Notre Dame. Uh, the test section, which is this black area you see with the windows, is a uh, uh, about feet, uh, six feet long, and uh, the, the cross section is two by two. This wind tunnel is known as the two by two wind tunnel. We have uh, three of these. <clears throat> so flow is uh, from left to right, and uh, the wind intensity can be adjusted, adjusted in the order of uh, uh, tens of meters per second. Okay, so this is the interior of the tunnel. You can see here the model, uh, black here. Uh, the arrows represent the, um, uh, uh, essentially represent the direction and the intensity, the profile of the wind uh, impacting the building in one of the configurations we considered. Uh, here, the, these uh, white curves uh, represent the wake uh, in this case we expect. And what we try to do is to measure both. Okay, the, the, uh, the flow, the oncoming flow because that informed the numerical simulation and the wake which we use to validate numerical simulation. Uh, so one additional assumption, which I did not mention before because I wanted to reserve this for the, uh, these images, that as you can see, uh, upstream of the building, uh, there is no topography, okay? Uh, the reason why we did this is that uh, so we don't know exactly the topography that might have been when the tumor building uh, was still existing. There could have been trees or other buildings. And so utilizing a completely smooth surface ahead of the building is the most conservative hypothesis. Okay, uh, this is the physical model uh, that we utilized. Uh, of course, it's simplified. Uh, and it's a scale one to 500. These results in a uh, height of 18 millimeter, a uh, width of 30 millimeter, and a length of 98 millimeter. Uh, I wanted to show very briefly the process to 3D print these. And here on the left side, you can see three of the modest, of the modest we printed. Uh, so what did, uh, did we do with these? Uh, we, uh, the, the, the type of measurements we conducted are all based on imaging. So we utilized uh, two imaging approaches. Um, these imaging approaches share three elements. So the first one is the use of a, a digital camera using an example here in this image, uh, looking uh, normally to the plane of measurements. Uh, the plane of measurement is uh, uh, illustrated by that green triangle, okay? What that is, uh, light sheets that we obtained by uh, using uh, high power lasers. You see a green uh, line here. This is the beam. We uh, essentially form a light sheet using a uh, number of optics. And the third element is the, of course, we have to uh, reveal the flaw. Air is transparent. So what we do, we in, uh, introduce tracers in the flaw. In this case, we use smoke. Um, that was obtained by nebulizing uh, a certain oil into microscopic particles. In this case, the particles were about one micron. So the first of the two methodologies that we utilized uh, I call here high-speed camera visualization. This is more of a qualitative approach. 
in which we use a continuous light, continuous laser, and uh, uh, coupled with a high-speed camera. In this case, we, uh, the one we, I'm showing here is collected at 1,000 frames per second. That, uh, this gives us the ability of uh, um, observing the dynamics of the flow, which you can see is very complex. Uh, the flow separates here and forms these uh, uh, very dynamic turbulent wakes, and this is the responsible for the dynamic load on the bill. Uh, but as I, I, I said, this is uh, uh, essentially uh, qualitative. Uh, it, it's hard to extract any quantitative uh, result from this. The second technique we utilized uh, is more of a, the quantitative technique. This allowed us to collect all the data that we passed to the numerical model. Uh, it's called uh, PIV, or Particle Image Dome Symmetry. This is a gold standard of flow measurements. Uh, this consists in uh, uh, using very high power pulsed laser. Why they're pulsed? Because this uh, the duration of the pulse is very short, is nanosecond. This allows us to uh, collect images that look like this, in which you see the position of each of the tracer particle uh, frozen in time. You see distribution of these white dots. Those are the small particles introduced in the flow. Now, uh, on the left side, this zoom, the version, what this shows is a detail of uh, that uh, flow. And uh, uh, I'm switching from two frames that were collected uh, with a very short time delay. Okay, it's, it's, this is possible by pulsing the laser at a very, very short time delay. That allows us to see uh, the distribution of the particle uh, and, their, and their movement. If your eyes can see the movement of that, those particles, it means that we can utilize um, um, image processing algorithm to track each individual particle or groups of them. Now I'll show you here an example of the image interrogation approach. In this case, uh, we subdivide the, the flow in little uh, windows, and uh, at each window, we track group of particle, reconstruct the local velocity. This is the instantaneous local velocity, okay? Now, if you apply these algorithms to the entire flow, the entire field of view, this is what you can uh, come up with. And this is essentially, uh, what I'm showing here is a, a number of uh, instantaneous flow field reconstructed with the PIB I described before. Uh, that, that the, the flow is color coded. Red means left to right, and blue means uh, uh, right to left. So essentially, this blue region is a what we call the recirculating region. Uh, this kind of line that keeps changing that you see, the yellow line, is what we call the shear layer. Anything below the shear layer is highly turbulent, and that's what we're interested in mostly. That's that's the part is very very difficult to reconstruct uh, numerically. Okay, the higher uh, the, the the more intense is the turbulence. The, the more difficult it is for numerical simulation to capture that complexity. Uh, so what we did is to uh, utilize three different configurations in terms of the angle of attack. Uh, here I'm showing the zero degree. So here's the wind is impacting the building. Uh, the, the wind and the uh, longitudinal axis are aligned. This is the um, probably the, the, the least dynamic load you can expect. Then we have a 45 degree and a 90 degree. This is what we expect to see the, the largest wake. So we applied those techniques in uh, these three different cases. On the left side, you see the uh, qualitative visualization that gives us an idea of, uh, of essentially the phenomenon, the dynamic phenomenon occurring in the floor. And uh, on, the, uh, on the right side, uh, a number of instantaneous flow uh, 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 fields uh, that essentially quantify the flow. Uh, as you can see, uh, the, the, the extension of the wake for this case is the largest and, the, the, and also the uh, intensity of the turbulence in the wake. So we can reasonably expect that this is the case in which uh, you have the largest dynamic load. So what we do with this uh, data, which is very uh, rich uh, in terms of information, 
Uh, there are many things you can do. Uh, uh, this is a not very conventional work for us. Typically, we use that data to explore the physics of the flow. In this case, uh, we wanted to simply extract uh, some um, attributes <laughs> of the flow that can be used by the structure analysis. But what we did, we averaged out uh, 3,000 samples of those instantaneous flow, uh, flow fields, particularly in this case, 3,000 samples, and obtained what we call the mean flow, which you see here on the left. Flow does not exist, however, is probably the most important result we have because it is statistically significant. What does that mean is that uh, to validate the numerical code, this flow obtained experimentally and the same flow obtained numerically have to look similar. Okay? Uh, to facilitate that comparison, what we conventionally do, instead of putting on top of each other two uh, very complex flow fields, we extract uh, at arbitrary location, here is this indicator with 3, 5, H, and 8, H. We extract uh, vertical profiles of velocity in the wake, which is the most difficult to characterize. And this is essentially the, the deliverable for this project, one of them, to give to the numerical simulation. And uh, essentially what we do in the numerical code, we compare these profiles with the one obtained numerically uh, to assess the uh, the the re reliability of the numerical simulation. So the other thing we did with the, the experiments is to what we call characterize the uh, oncoming flow. Well, this is important because it serves to initialize the numerical simulation, uh, essentially speed up uh, the um, convergence of those results uh, um, and make it more reliable. Uh, so in this case, what we did, we removed the model and uh, again, we collected uh, thousands of samples of the flow, uh, averaged them out again here on the uh, right side. This looks a little bit boring. All this uh, essentially is uh, what we call uniform flow. Uh, but th this was very important because we wanted to confirm some of the characteristics that uh, it's not um, very trivial to obtain. In fact, it took us several iterations to obtain this quality of the flow. What we did from here, we extract these uh, profiles, uh, again, at different uh, coordinates, and uh, we compare, so essentially we plot them on top of each other to make sure that they're all the same. This is very important to make sure that what we say, the, sh the, the boundary layer is fully developed. And this is the condition that is necessary to obtain uh, sound uh, numerical simulation. Uh, so to conclude this part, um, uh, the experimental analysis achieved, I would say, two main goals. The first, for, the first one is a, a parametric analysis of the worst uh, condition, the worst case condition that uh, we assume to be the next, and uh, uh, at, at least qualitatively by the flow visualization is confirmed to be the 90 degree. So we can focus in terms of the numerical analysis on one case. And the second is to obtain both the initialization and validation profiles that are really important for the numerical analysis. And uh, with this, uh, I now welcome to the podium uh, my colleague, Dimitris Pitadinis, who will detail the numerical simulation he conducted. Thank you. Gianluca. Uh, so, I will talk to you about uh, models uh, today and our numerical analysis. And we scientists, we uh, use models uh, to basically uh, predict the reality of real uh, full scale phenomena. Uh, for the case of the tuba building, uh, what we are after is actually the wind loads that a full scale uh, reconstruction of uh, the tuba building would experience. Uh, however, uh, real scale experiments, as you can imagine, are very difficult to uh, happen due to the limitations of the applied techniques and the apparatus. Uh, in this case, for example, the size of our wind tunnel is too small to fit a full scale 
uh, reproduction of the Tumba building. Uh, however, uh, in practice, we work with scaled down versions of this reality. And uh, the question is, how can we really uh, use this information to get the uh, values that we need for our structural analysis? In other words, how can we use the estimates of force uh, in this scaled model to predict what happens in a real scale? And the forces uh, that act in a building are actually uh, computed as the product between the density, uh, the drag uh, force coefficient that uh, Gianluca introduced, uh, the velocity of the air, and the projected area of the building in reality and in the model, respectively. Now, uh, we need an assumption to bridge these two scales. And the assumptions we used here is that the drag coefficient, CD, both in reality and in models, is the same. An assumption that uh, the scientists from our dynamic community, we know that is valid when the flow is turbulent, both in reality and in the model. And this we know it happens when uh, the wind speed is quick enough that we consider it really to be fully turbulent, very chaotic, as uh, Gianluca a nice chaotic behavior of the wind behind the building. Now, in practice, we check whether a flow is fully turbulent using what we call uh, the so-called Reynolds number, which is really a ratio between the product of the incoming velocity, the height of the building, divided uh, by what we call is a kinematic viscosity, which is really a measure of the friction, the resistance that the air uh, passes to the building. And we check it indeed, both in reality and in our models, the flow is indeed fully turbulent. So our assumption is valid. Now, if we take just the ratio between these forces, uh, we can see actually that uh, knowing uh, the force that act in the model, uh, we can easily estimate um, the flow, uh, the real uh, force that the flow would um, cause uh, as uh, the multiplication of similarity scale between the velocity squared multiplied by a geometrical uh, scale ratio lambda. Now, just like physical models, like the models that Gianluca showed us, numerical models are methods uh, used by scientists to estimate quantities of interest. In our case, the load, the wind loads on the structure. And typically they involve the solution of really <laughs> complex nonlinear equations. And I really didn't mean to bore you with ugly equations on the board. And really it's usually, it's 10% of what I usually put in my posters, but that's part of working in a nice interdisciplinary team. Uh, but in general, they are really complex nonlinear equations that involve quantities like the velocity u of the wind, the pressure field p, which is very important in our analysis, and then properties of the fluid, like the density r of r, uh, assigned as the Greek letter rho, and the kinematic viscosity nu, uh, which play an important role uh, in our model. Now, the advantage of these approaches are that most of the experimental methods provide locally quantities, like velocity, for example, as Gianluca showed. The numerical models provide a detailed full description of the flow in 3D. Now, the disadvantages here is that we need to validate this numerical model, make sure that they are representative of the real uh, world cases, and they typically require uh, some computational resources uh, to get the results. Excuse me. Now, to get the solution, there are hierarchy of flow modeling techniques and approaches that we can adopt uh, to estimate the weight uh, behind uh, a building 
or uh, also uh, to get the wind loads uh, on a structure like the Tumba building. And we start with something that we call direct numerical simulation that really resolve all the complex scales uh, that the real uh, wind uh, causes. Uh, but this comes in a very high computational cost, meaning we might need to run the problem in large supercomputers and even run simulations for weeks. So if on the other side, we have approximated solutions that give us less detailed description of the flow, gives the mean flow. Uh, and these are uh, what we call Reynold Average Navier Stokes approaches. But this comes in a fraction of the cost, of the computational cost. In other words, it's much more practical for our applications. Thus, uh, while a detailed uh, flow is always desired, uh, the computational cost is prohibited at the moment. So we adopted uh, the mean uh, flow approach uh, for this preliminary study of our analysis. Just like the experimental team, we have to build a computational domain that mimics the characteristics of the wind tunnel experiment. And then, we had also to create a computational grid. This set of cuboids, this set of cubes, is basically a discretized uh, version of the computational domain. The generation of such computational grid requires a detailed description of the structure, typically involving some uh, computer aid design softwares, uh, that then uh, is passed to as an information to the grid generation uh, routines uh, that we have developed uh, to have the uh, final computational grid. Now the resolution uh, is not uniform across all the domains. We increase the resolution locally in areas that we know a priori uh, that uh, we expect the uh, stresses to be significant in order to be able to resolve uh, these uh, changes and pass it to the structural team. Now, to connect our numerical results to the experiments that uh, the experimental team uh, did, we just used the PIV observations from the wind tunnel. Whatever they measured at the, uh, up as the uh, incoming flow, uh, we used it as um, boundary condition in our numerical model uh, in order to make sure that uh, both numerical and experimental results uh, refer to the same flow conditions. Now, as I said, it's very important to uh, validate the results of our numerical model. And thus, we use some uh, profiles at the uh, lead side, at the downwind side, uh, inside the wake uh, region of uh, uh, the flow. And in this side, uh, we managed to basically reconstruct the wake that takes place behind the building and was measured by the experimental uh, team. Uh, these arrows basically show uh, the direction of the mean flow, uh, and it can really resemble what the experimental team uh, measured uh, at the lab. The presence of this strong uh, flow separation and recirculation zone at the downwind side is really associated with enhanced form or pressure drag. In other words, is the reason why we have strong forces acting on the table building. Now, the detailed measurements that uh, uh, the experimental team um, took were compared against the numerical results we obtained and the agreement was really satisfactory, which uh, increased the confidence in our results, our numerical results. Now, the idea is that after we uh, validated the flow field, uh, we wanted to extract the loads for the structural analysis. Uh, as I said, uh, we have a very detailed description uh, of uh, uh, these loads in 3D and we really uh, perform a 
uh, parametric analysis uh, for uh, various angles of attack. And here I'm showing the results for uh, the zero and 90 degrees angle of attack. And I show here um, the integrated forces, the total forces uh, that uh, the scaled model would experience. Uh, the take-home uh, message from uh, this plot is basically that firstly, the 90 degrees angle of attack is indeed the worst case scenario uh, that uh, could happen in nature. Uh, and also, uh, it, it's important to stress here that uh, in this case, most of the uh, force uh, is caused by pressure difference uh, between the upwind and downwind sides of the structure, which means that the flow separation, this wake, is really the source of uh, the forces that the building experience. In contrary, when we are examining the zero angles of attack, uh, this is not the case. Uh, while in 90 degrees, we have nearly two orders of magnitude difference between the pressure forces, which are the forces due to the um, pressure, of course, and the shear forces, which are due to friction, uh, for the zero angle of attack, uh, we can see that actually the total forces uh, really uh, are uh, equivalent. Uh, both pressure forces and viscous forces have the same order of magnitude. Now, after we got all this information, uh, we went back to the three-dimensional models and we tried to find a characteristic um, cross-section. For this, we picked a cross-section uh, uh, that would be represented from all these three-dimensional forces that I plot here as vectors and make sure that I hope you can see uh, these small uh, vectors here. Uh, we picked the position that really had uh, the worst uh, wind loads acting on the building. And this information is what we really pass to the colleagues that do the structural analysis of the temple. And with that, I will uh, ask Gianluca to come back and finalize the part four. So this is the uh, last part of uh, the wind analysis. I wanted to uh, give, kind of recap uh, the analysis we presented uh, so far, and uh, um, so we can focus on what was the uh, ultimate goal, which was to uh, provide some actual numbers to the structural analysis, so they could be used for the analysis. Uh, so as a recap, uh, I, I hope that by this time it has uh, been clear that most of the work we've been doing is to try to obtain reliable representation of the floor around the scale model and uh, uh, in, in order to extract the, the wind load uh, on the model. But I'm gonna try to explain to you how we transfer this force on a very, very small model to the actual uh, building or at least uh, to, these, to the reconstruction. Okay, uh, so I, I refer to some of the plots that uh, Dimitri just uh, showed to you. Uh, uh, as you have seen, uh, we were able to reconstruct the entire pressure distribution on the entire model, which is represented here. You can see this yellow area. This is uh, um, all the positive pressure on the, on the front side of the building, yeah, and there is negative pressure on the lee side, and the pressure difference produces the force. Uh, the, uh, here's the, the force. Uh, so the, the model, uh, after undergoing a little bit of uh, uh, stabilization, converges very well to the number of, you see it's slightly above uh, 0 0.01, which uh, as Dimitri said, it's uh, more than a magnitude higher uh, for this case, for the 90 degree case than uh, the aligned. Okay, so how do we transfer this, which is a very, very small 10 centimeter model to a 10 centimeter building? 
uh, as Dimitri mentioned, we utilize this number here. It's called the Reynolds number. It's uh, very important for mechanics. And uh, we have to introduce uh, the last uh, assumption, which is if this number is above a certain threshold that has been established by the researchers, then we can confidently assume that these two parameters, this CD, is the drag coefficient that essentially is a parameter that expresses uh, 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 the, the, the unique uh, um, aerodynamicity of this uh, of the building. So we can assume that the drag coefficient for the model and for the real case are the same. And this is very powerful because then I, I go back to one of the slides that you showed. Uh, this is how we express press the forces here on the top uh, left. This is the real case, and this is the model case. Now, if you recombine these equations, uh, essentially you take the ratio of these forces, you end up, if the, uh, the two drag coefficients are the same, then you end up with these two ratios that we call C and lambda. And essentially we know everything about these two because we know that lambda essentially is the scale. We know it's uh, five to one in length, so it's a square, 500 square in terms of the areas here. We know the uh, velocity, the wind speed and the model, which is 5.5 meters per second. So the only variable which is unknown is the wind speed in the real case, okay? Uh, so if we uh, pick one speed, we'll be able to resolve this relationship. So what we did is a very, very brief uh, analysis of the um, meteorological um, measurements uh, in proximity of left Gandhi. Uh, unfortunately, there is no uh, meteorological session there. We've been talking about collecting data there. Perhaps we can do that in the future. But we refer to the uh, at least the, these two, Calcutta and Tanagra. These are the closest one. Uh, uh, in, and essentially, we extracted from the record the distribution of the maximum hourly wind that impact the, uh, the, 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 you can reasonably expect if you assume that the climate hasn't changed that much. Uh, this is the kind of wind that uh, the building would have been exposed to. Uh, so this distribution, if you see these, uh, the, the tail of the distribution represent the extreme events. So the very, very, very strong winds. And the peak of this distribution represents what we call the prevailing wind. Okay, and th this data is very rich, and that we can uh, refer also to the direction. So, the next thing we did uh, uh, is to think: okay, what, where was the wind coming from? One of the uh, one of the hypotheses is that one of the strongest wind will come from the north. This is very Notorious wind is called the Meltemi. It's notorious to people, but also to sailors. And um, as I have experienced personally, is uh, very, very strong in that area. These were uh, left candy in the tuba building. So it's uh, it's very uh, you can reasonably assume that that was impacted by this wind. So in this case, uh, what I chose to do uh, as an example, I uh, extracted the uh, the wind record from this station, which is just north of Left Candy. And from that record, I then extracted a sub a subsample of data, which is the wind coming from the north. And this, you know, again, the distribution of that wind is expressed here. You can see that the peak here is about 22.5 meters per second. Now we have the uh, a reconstruction of the uh, wind that may have impacted the building. We go back to the relationship and uh, so what we can find as an example uh, you can assume that the force the total wind load on the building was about four thousand times higher than the model and that's the pretty much the value that um, uh, the, the structural team could use uh, they're gonna show a much more uh, comprehensive parametric analysis which they uh, uh, analyze different wind con intensity conditions. The other thing we can do, uh, we can also extract from the numerical model uh, the inter 
pressure distribution that you really show. And uh, essentially do the same, uh, find a slightly different scaling parameters, uh, but substantially the same approach. And they're, they're gonna show you a little bit, uh, these analysis a little bit more in details. One other thing that I would like to mention as a, a ongoing work, or work in progress that I, uh, we don't want to uh, overwhelm you with, but what we have done, and perhaps we can do in future work, is examine the impact of the um, angle, the roof pitch angle, which is uh, potentially unimportant. And as Alessandro explained, uh, the reconstruction of 45 degrees is an hypothesis. There is some controversy around that. We believe that the angle within certain range is not highly impactful. Here we consider three angle, uh, essentially uh, 40, 45, and 90 degree. And these are, are the uh, experimental data we obtain with uh, these three models at different angles of time. Um, well, in conclusion, I'd like to uh, say that as a future work, uh, we're planning to complete uh, the wind analysis uh, for the cases with different pitch angle, which uh, uh, has been done for the experimental part, but it has not been implemented uh, numerically. And one of the other things we'd like to do is uh, to extend the analysis to more complex dynamics. As you see, uh, what we studied here is the mean flow, but we have not considered yet the importance of the impulsive effect of these uh, vortices shedding from uh, the structure, which uh, very, very likely would uh, increase the load of the building. And uh, with this, I would like to conclude and uh, welcome to the podium the next speaker. Or there is a break, probably. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gianluca. I thank all of the uh, members of the uh, fluid dynamics uh, team. Uh, again, uh, our team uh, will uh, be happy to take any questions at the end in the Q and A uh, during the, the the panel discussion. Uh, we already have some uh, very interesting questions, which we, by the way, will stick into the program. We'll take at the end. Um, uh, we will now have we're a little uh, ahead. We're a little uh, early on our uh, program, which is good. But we'll give you. We'll give us some more time for uh, uh, questions and answers. Uh, it's now, I believe, uh, 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 10 to 11, and we will take a short break, uh, 10 minutes, and we'll reconvene at 11 here. Thank you. Hello again. We are uh, resuming our works. Uh, it is my pleasure to now welcome to the podium Liam Abujabdeh, who was uh, instrumental to... Uh, carrying out the, uh, well, probably one of the most important parts of this uh, uh, research, uh, the uh, structural finite element analysis of the portion of the building around post C4, which as we know, was uh, the probably the weakest point of the, the structure of the Tumba building. Uh, now, they, we are already having uh, lots of uh, interesting, important questions in the, in the Q&A and in the chat. And we will make sure we, we, we take this question, we discuss those uh, points at length in the, in the Q&A. Uh, of course, there may be more questions. If you have any, any question about the, the technicalities, uh, please uh, send them either in real time, we will keep track, or at the end. And I, I now welcome uh, Liam Abushafte to the podium after his general presentation of the finite element analysis. There will be another presentation by uh, Brad Weldon, uh, Paolo Bandini, and Eduardo Davila it's from uh, New Mexico State University, who will uh, uh, um, outline the next stages of the, one of the important parts of the next stages of our work, experimental work with the uh, mud brick to determine uh, how strong the mud brick uh, walls of the Tumba building square, building where, and how the loads may have been transferred from the frame to the uh, mud brick walls of the building. Without further ado, I welcome uh, Liam. Thank you for Hi, everyone. Again, my name is Liam, and I'll be presenting the structural analysis work completed by Dr. Jim Elliman, Dr. Yaya Karama, Dr. Brad Weldon, and myself. I'll discuss the preliminary findings and the next steps for this project. 
So what was our objective? Our objective was to assess whether the structure could withstand the imposed loads without buckling. So basically, could we figure out whether the building fails based on the assumptions that we made? So it's one of the two uh, subcategories of things we wanted to look into. What were the structural purposes of the veranda and wall post? So if we look at this image on screen, the veranda posts are on the exterior on both the left and right side, and the interior posts are the posts lined up right against the wall. And on top of that, our lateral brace is necessary in order for the structure to stand. So our lateral brace is necessary on the exterior posts and adjoined to the interior posts. So our method for conducting the analysis, as Alexander just mentioned, we're using finite element analysis, which is basically allowing us to break complex physical structures into smaller and smaller and more refined pieces. Uh, for this analysis, we're using SAP2000, which is a structural analysis program, so allow us to test numerous structural scenarios. The main reason we want to use uh, this structural analysis program is because it allows us to perform a critical buckling load analysis. A critical buckling load analysis basically allows us to determine whether the forces on a column uh, are, too, are too great and the column will basically break. So if we look at the image on screen to the far left, the tall rectangle is representing a column and the arrow uh, in black on top is representing a force. If this force exceeds the column's strength, the column will begin to buckle and then eventually fail, which we see in the image to the right. So again, if we look at the video on the left side of the screen, this is a, um, a basic test for what buckling would look like. This column is located uh, vertically by the rice. When the uh, load basically exceeds the column's strength, the column buckles. On the right side of the screen, we can now see how the structural analysis program indicates this with the center column oscillating in both directions. So this would indicate buckling in the program. So here's a simplified rendering of the structure. Again, this is simplified. Here we're going along the absolute, uh far side. We're going along the building, which is about 50 meters in total length and 13 to 15 meters in width. You see the exterior post on the side, 45 degree roof pitch. Now we're entering the building. You see the tall slender columns and the adobe brick walls. So as mentioned in one of the uh, earlier presentations, we're focusing on the center post C4, which I'll get into in the next slide. Uh, what we're looking at on screen is a plan view. So if you can imagine a bird's eye view looking down the structure, if we remove the roof, we see kind of what the frame looks like. All of this uh, geometry and uh, configurations were determined based on the British excavation team's findings, which we see here on screen. If you notice going from right to left, which was mentioned earlier, the posts are labeled sequentially one through 30. You may also notice towards the center section of the building where the north arrow is located, that there's a bunch of posts and uh, geometric properties that are not labeled. This was again due to the fact of illegal bulldozing, so this area of the building can only be assumed. Here we see center, uh, center post C4, which is the section we're going to be looking at. So why do we pick center post C4, and why are we looking into this section specifically? For two reasons. One being the tributary width and the post diameter. At center post C4, which we see in the graph to the right, center post C4 has the largest tributary width. Now, if we look at this graph on the far left side of the screen, you have the vertical asset axis representing the tributary width. Center post C4 has the greatest tributary width, which would then mean it carries the greatest load. Now, on top of that, center post C4 also is the smallest section, as indicated at the top of the screen, as it's 18 centimeters in comparison to the other center posts. For this reason, center post C4 is the weakest element and it carries the greatest load. That means that if we can model this uh, critical section and demonstrate that this section is able to withstand the loads, then that would mean that the entire building would be even stronger and the other sections could withstand their loads. So when we came up with the structural layout, again, the dimensions and the post imprints were known from the archeological documentation of the area. Um, the height, again, we'd assume a 45 degree roof pitch. So if we look at the bottom three images, this just kind of gives you an idea for how, if we assume a greater roof pitch somewhere between 40 and 50, which was seen during that time period, if we assume a greater roof pitch. So the far right side of the screen, you can see the height of the building increases. The 45 degree roof pitch was what Colton assumed. So we proceeded with that again, with about 8.5 to 8.6 meters in total height. We assumed a height of the veranda post, as Colton also assumed, is 1.5 meters. Again, this would allow a person to pass underneath the post. And then we also assumed that these interior posts that are lined up against the wall were flush against the wall, so that there was no spacing between the two. So here is the uh, section view that we came up with. Again, you can see all the post diameters and the uh, basic ge geometric portrait properties at the bottom of the screen. Now, just to go through what the different elements are located, just so you can get a better idea. Again, 1.5 meters for the veranda post, representing the person. 
which you can see by the green arrows pointing to the exterior of veranda posts, which I'll continue to talk about. The blue arrows are pointing to the bottom portions of the wall, which were likely made from rubble masonry or stone. The top portions of the wall, likely made from adobe brick, which there's evidence for. And the gray arrow is now pointing to those interior posts or wall posts. The orange arrow is pointing to the center post, in this case, section C4, so C4 in this case. And the purple arrow is pointing to the roof. Now the roof was likely made from timber beams, uh, spanning from the top of the center post down to the wall, and then the wall down to the exterior posts. And again, thatch was likely laid on top of this. And then you can see up top um, how we followed the British excavation team's labeling of the site and the different properties. So if we look at the far left side of the screen, BS10 is representing the veranda on the south side, V for veranda, S for south side, and then the sequential number. The same for the interior posts labeled by the south by the S side, and the same for the center posts labeled by C. So one of the main things we'd look into before we started modeling was what kind of materials was the building made up of? Because this will affect the overall mass of the building and strength. So adobe brick uh, was known to be, uh, again, to make up the upper portions of the wall. Stone masonry or rubble masonry making up the bottom portions of the wall. Now for the timber, uh, JJ Colton uh, hypothesized a few different types of timber or that could have been used in this area. One being the Douglas fir, as Dr. Pertini mentioned, as well as the Pinus nigra tree. The Pinus nigra is more well known in terms of material properties, so we proceeded with that for our material uh, properties and stiffnesses, as well as, again, the thatch laid on top of the roof. So how strong were the connections? Based on the fact that the building was built 3,000 years ago, we had to really think about what kind of tools were available during this time period. So one of the main concerns was how strong were these connections between the timber? So obviously this is different than means that we see today. So one of, the, one of those, those were one of the concerns we look into, as well as the fact that, of, did the post move in the ground? So the end restraints versus the base restraints, which I'm gonna get into. So you can see here, how are we gonna model this kind of sort of uh, restraints in the base based on the fact that the posts were likely dug into the ground and compacted with rocks and pebbles. And you can kind of get an idea for this here. So we broke this down to three kinds of connections. One between the timber, which are all the top restraints. The second being at the ground or at the base, which I just mentioned. And the third being at the wall. So we look at this image here where the green arrows are pointing. You can see kind of this circle that's on top of the roof. It's laid on, laid on top. Now this was likely a longitudinal beam that spanned throughout the entire length of the structure. So if you can imagine that the circle is going in and out of the screen, now it's likely tied. Now the question was, how are we gonna model this load transfer between the roof to the interior post and then the interior post to the wall? And again, you can see a nice drawing of this uh, sort of connection right here. So we had four different types of potential restraints we could use when modeling. Going from rigid to not rigid at all from left to right. So the fixed restraint, this is a sort of restraint that's completely rigid. So it can't move in the vertical, horizontal direction, nor can it rotate. The pin restraint is the same as a fixed restraint, except it can rotate. So it, it doesn't have rotational freedom. It does have rotational freedom. The roller restraint is simply unable to move in the vertical direction, but it can move horizontally and rotate. And then a free restraint can move in any which direction, so it's not rigid at all. So when we modeled the restraints between the timber, so at the top, these resemble pin, pin restraints based on the fact that they were simply tied with rope. So they could rotate and they could not move in the X and Y direction. When we modeled the restraints to the ground, we had to consider many different factors. Now, based on the fact that the timber, which we see here highlighted, the timber at the ground was likely compacted with rocks and dirt and not in conventional means that we see today. This was likely between a pin restraint and a fixed restraint because it's just simply being compacted with dirt. So it likely had some sort of rotation, but not a lot. So it was still rigid, but it wasn't completely rigid. Whereas these walls you see here, these spanned throughout the entire length of the building. They were very thick and they also carried a lot of mass. These were models fixed restraints to the walls. Now, again, as we mentioned earlier, how to model this load transfer between the, the main rafters, which is the roof, into the interior posts, down into the wall. So this is one of the questions and issues we ran into, how to model this load transfer. Again, how to model this connection we see here. So because of this issue, um, Dr. Weldon, which is who he'll give you a presentation after me today, um, he established a relationship between Notre Dame and New Mexico State to basically uh, further understand this load and to basically take the properties away from this load transfer and then input them back into our model. So he'll be running two tests not to failure and two tests to failure, which he'll get into after my presentation. So again, because we couldn't model that load transfer that we saw on the last slide, 
between the main roof into the, the longitudinal beam or circle that we saw into the interior post and into the, therefore into the wall. We broke this down into two separate scenarios, each scenario being more conservative than with the two combined. So scenario one being with the wall and no interior post. So we're moving those interior posts entirely. Scenario two being with the wall and without the, sorry, without the wall and with the interior post. So this is basically just the frame of the structure. Again, the reason behind this would be if we can prove that in each of these cases where we have an element removed separately, if both stand, that would mean that the two combined, the structure would be even stronger and therefore it would make our results feasible. So as Dr. Piratini uh, mentioned earlier, there is an equation to predict the critical blocking load of an element. So basically there is an equation to predict how much force an element can withstand. But again, this is an estimate for when the column will break. We'll see at the far left side of the screen, the equation, again, factors such as E, modulus elasticity or stiffness, I, the cross section. So basically the geometric properties, whether the shape and the diameter, the length or width. But then we'll also see in the denominator, as he mentioned earlier, K and L and how they're magnified by being squared. L is represented to the slenderness or the total length of the column. And the K value, again, is gonna go back to what we were just talking about in terms of the restraints that we assign to the structure. So if we see here on the right side of the screen, these are different kinds of restraints I believe that Dr. Creatini mentioned, just to rehash them and go over them. We have a fixed fix restraint, as we see here, uh, towards the middle of the screen with K equals 0.5. This is a completely rigid restraint, so our K value would be very small. This would mean that since it's in the denominator, if we have a small value, we'd have an even higher buckling load. So the strength of the column would be even greater if you have a more rigid element. Now, if we look at the far right side of the screen, which is what Hurt assumed, this is a, a pretty pretty unrestrained um, condition based on the fact that K is 2.0. So a greater K value would mean a lower critical buckling load. So from left to right, basically the idea you can take away is if you have more rigid, rigid restraints, you're gonna have a higher critical buckling load. It's gonna be harder to break an element. So again, Hurt assumed a K value of 2.0. Now, based on uh, use, just using Euler's equation, you can get an idea for how the critical bucking load, PCR, would be extremely small, small at 19 kilonewtons. Um, again, we imagine that the uh, condition would likely be somewhere between a pin-pin connection and a fixed pin connection, based on the fact that, again, the base of C4, if in terms of looking at the uh, red rectangle uh, on screen to the left, the base was likely, uh, what we know is compacted by dirt and rocks and pebbles. This means that there was likely rigidity, but there wasn't complete rigidity. So at the base, it would likely make more sense to make it pinned or fixed. Now at the top, we have the rafter is leaning on top. So there is, there is um, some sort of rigidity there based on the fact that they're tied. They're not completely free like Hurt assumed. So again, we can get an idea for how it's likely compacting the ground. Now, as mentioned earlier, Euler's equation cannot uh, model um, and correctly understand the taper of the center post. So we had to look into how would a tapered center post affect the critical buckling load? Would it, would it, how much weaker would basically the element be? Because of this, we modeled three separate scenarios, one being without the taper, so we just were consistent with the 18 centimeters going from the bottom of the element up to the top, or bottom of the column to the top. So at the bottom of the column, we have an 18 centimeter cross section, and at the top, we have an 18 centimeter cross section. The second being with a taper, so at the bottom, cross section would be 18 centimeters, or 0.18 meters, and at the top, it'd be half of that, so nine centimeters, which is very conservative. And then the third being a mean of the two. So this is an average of the 18 and the nine that we saw in the taper. So basically we wanna take away, will the taper um, of the center post, will the critical buckling load be less than the mean of the taper? That's what we were trying to look into. So before I get into the actual models that we uh, created, I just wanna quickly summarize the modeling assumptions that we determined. One being the joints were able to withstand all the loads. So in other terms, all the rope connection wouldn't simply crack. The second being that the top connections are pinned, which I mentioned earlier, and allow for rotation. Again, the ropes were made from, likely made from vegetable fibers, fibers used to tie beams and posts. And again, ro rotation meaning moment releases, so it wasn't completely re uh, rigid. We're modeling section C4, taking basically a section cut of the building with the purpose of simplifying our assumptions and speeding up model computational time. And right now, what we're gonna be looking at is dead load analysis. So we're gonna be looking at the self-weight of the elements or how much the elements themselves weigh. And on top of that, a thatch load of 45 kilograms per meter squared, which is conservative. Um, and then before I get into this, um, we're using the metric system to be cons uh, consistent with the British excavation team's data. So we're using kilonewtons and meters. And just for reference, one kilonewton is about one ton force. So here we're looking at the base model, our 2D section cut that we took of <coughs> section C4. You can see how the loads were applied on top representing the uh, roof load and the corresponding ridge beam spanning. 
Again, the, you can see on the left side of the screen, the SAP 2000 model or structural analysis program model. The walls are extruded so much because they span the entire length of the building, so we must take the tributary width. Now we verified the 2D model with a 3D model here, which you can see. So we basically span it out from C4 to C5, which is what you see here. And we're basically making sure that our assumptions are correct. So here's a chart that was created just to basically verify the models. Now there's a lot to look at. Basically what you can take away is we created uh, four different cases to basically confirm that the axial loads made sense. We created two 2D models, one being where the, the, the uh, wall was modeled in, as different elements in the structural analysis program and then one with the 3D model as well as hand calculations. So we can see here in yellow all the different axial loads. Um, they're negative based on the fact that they're being compressed by the roof, being pushed down. So here's a graph where you can basically uh, take away how similar all the different models were. You know, they're all pretty much in the same area in terms of magnitude, so we're able to uh, confidently say that the models made sense and were verified. So now that we had verified our models, we can start running variations. Again, we were running variations for the, the base restraints. So here what we're looking at is scenario one. Again, scenario one was with the wall and without the interior posts. So on the left side of the screen, we have variation 1A, where all the posts are pinned and the wall is fixed. If we look just at the base of the two models, you can see triangles and rectangles. The triangles represent pin restraints, which I believe Dr. Piratini mentioned earlier as hinge restraints. The rectangles represent fixed restraints, which you see there. So basically, the only difference between 1A and 1B is that in 1A, uh, we have a less rigid model based on the fact that the post, the timber post, are modeled as pinned, so they can rotate. Whereas in 1B, we have the, the uh, timber post modeled as fixed, so they're completely rigid. So 1B is much more rigid than 1A. And then for each one of these cases I mentioned earlier, we're running three different cases, one with, where the center post is not tapered at all, one where it has a taper, and one where you have the average of the taper, or mean. So here's 1A. Um, so on the left side of the screen, again, we have pin restraints for the timber and we have the fixed restraints for the wall. On the right side of the screen, what you can take away from this is that the red, the red rectangles represent the buckling load. The blue rectangles represent the axial load. Axial load is in the forces on the element. So if the blue exceeds the red, we have a failing center post. Now, all of the uh, analyses that we ran confirmed that center post C4 would be the first element to buckle, so it's the most critical element. But in all the cases you see here, it does not buckle. The buckling load is much greater than the uh, axial load on it. So in other terms, the capacity of the element does not uh, exceed its demands. Um, and then you can also take away from this how without the taper, we have the greatest critical buckling, critical buckling load. But with the taper, with, with the tapered center post, we have a greater uh, critical buckling load than with the mean of the taper. And this was a constant pattern that we saw throughout all the models. So I'll be proceeding with the tapered center post because this is most realistic. So the second case, 1B, again, we have uh, all the posts fixed and we have the wall fixed. Again, we're removing the interior post. You can see again, the critical buckling load is greater than the axial load, so we have a stable structure. On top of that, now you see the critical buckling load has gone up. This is because now the element is more rigid because we assigned it a fixed restraint at the base. So now we're going into scenario two where we have removed the wall altogether and we just have the interior post. So we basically just have a frame. Now, 2A and 2B are similar, and 2C and 2D are similar. The only difference between 2A and 2B is that in 2A, all the posts are pinned, as, as 2B is all the posts are pinned. The only difference being that there's a lateral brace added. So in 2B, if you look down, you can see the lateral brace between the exterior post and the interior post was added. Now, in 2C and 2D, same scenario, except all of the posts are fixed. So we have more rigid in 2C and 2D. And again, we're running the three separate cases where we have no taper, I mean the taper and the taper altogether. So now we're looking at all the post pin and the no ladder braces. So all of these posts can rotate. Now you might see on the right side of the screen the axial load is greater than the critical buckling load. This is because it's an unrealistic scenario. No building has no rigidity in its base, simply would fall over based on any load that's applied to it. So this is unrealistic. The reason why we were demonstrating this is because if you simply add lateral braces, the building becomes stable, which you can see here, where the critical buckling load is now greater than the axial load. So what you can take away from this is that adding lateral braces improves the structure of rigidity greatly. Okay, so now we're looking at all the post fix and no lateral braces. So the same as 2A, except now we have rigidity in all of the bases. You see the critical buckling load is increased because it's more rigid. You'll see that again, we have a stable structure. 
Same thing when we add lateral braces, the critical bucking load went up just a tad because, again, the lateral braces increase the rigidity of the structure. So again, in all these cases, the critical bucking load is greater than the axial load, so we have a stable structure. So if we look at the far left side of the screen, again, we were modeling all these 2D models and we had verified them with the 3D model in the center. Now you may have noticed that we didn't include multiple rafters um, at center post C4, which you can see here. So C4 matching up with the 2D model. So what we did was just to make sure we wanted to add the uh, rafters to the 3D model revised all the way to the right, as well as increase the thatch load to the maximum that we possibly could have, which is what Dr. Piritini mentioned earlier. So we increased it from 45 kilograms per meter squared to 70. So we can see that here. Basically, the uh, blue rectangle is showing that the, uh, the simplified 3D model where we didn't add the rafters, we have a thatch weight of 45 kilograms per meter squared, which is still conservative. But in orange, we increased the thatch load to the maximum it could possibly be of 70, as well as adding the rafters. And you can still see that the critical bucking load is greater than the axial load. So again, stable structure. Okay, so now to get into the wind analysis, um, just to reiterate, the aerospace and mechanical team provided us pressures, given at a speed of 5.5 meters per second. So we had to scale these values up to the wind speed that we were testing. The speeds were applied on the 2D model in the X and Z direction. So the X being the horizontal direction and the Z being the vertical direction. Um, I just want to quickly mention the fact that what this looks like right here might just be the roof, but we also applied the X component of the wind loads onto the walls, which was conservative based on the fact that there would be likely be some protection from the roof, but we applied um, a, a maximum X component force on the walls to see if the building could, with, could still withstand the loads. So we utilized the maximum pressure on the upwind and downwind sides. The left side of the uh, loads that you're seeing on the screen, so from about zero meters down to negative 0 0.015, um, we're seeing the downward side because the arrows are pointing downward. Just for reference, this was the south side of the building. On the right side, so from zero meters, so it's 0 0.015 meters on the graph. This is the upward side or leeward side. And basically how we came up with our results, uh, comparing, we compared the stresses resulting from the wind to the maximum allowable stresses in the elements. So again, left side of the screen, that's what was provided to us by the wind team along with the corresponding uh, numerical data. We applied this onto the SAP 2000 model in uh, a weaker case. And again, while it's not shown here, we did apply the X component of the wind loads onto the walls directly. So there is no shading from any of the posts. Now, this element right here, the, mount, the main rafter on the south side or downward side, as indicated <laughs> by the downward arrows, was, in, was identified as the most critical element. When I say critical element, I'm referring to the fact that this would be the first element to fail under the wind analysis. So basically, we tested different, different wind speeds based on uh, corresponding weather stations, I believe as the aerospace team spoke on earlier. So if we look at the left side of the screen, we can see a basic chart of basically the demand on that, on that rafter that we just identified, the most critical <coughs> rafter. So we're comparing the governing strength or stress that's caused by the wind loads from that wind speed, comparing it to what that, what that uh, element can basically withstand, as in the capacity. So you'll see at 22.5 meters per second, we have a stable structure. The demand does not exceed the capacity, which is also indicated on the right side of the screen from this graph. The blue line, if the speed is above the blue line, it basically means you have a failing structure. If it's below, uh, you, have a stable, you have a stable structure. So any speed below 22.5 meters per second so zero to 22.5 meters per second was found as our preliminary results to be withstandable wind pressure for the building. So just for some reference, 22.5 meters per second is about 50 miles per hour. So if we look at the left side of the screen, we can see a Google Earth image as to left condi indicated by the yellow pin, which is where the Tumba building is located. To Nagar, Greece, it located uh, at the bottom of the image, the same Google Earth image in the, by the red pin. This weather station was the 22.4 meters per second. As mentioned earlier, 22.4 meters per second is the maximum wind speed ever recorded at Tanager, Greece. And again, we have a maximum wind speed for the building at 22.5. So we anticipate the building being fairly strong. <laughs> now, if you look at the right side of the screen, another visualization, the 50 mile per hour wind corresponds somewhere in a strong gale. So again, the building is fairly strong for this time period. So what are the takeaways from uh, the preliminary findings of all of our analyses? One being the original reconstruction with the veranda or exterior post is structurally sound when subjected to gravity and wind loads. Second, 
The building can withstand a speed of up to 22.5 meters per second, so zero to 22.5 meters per second. The building will not fail in anywhere along the uh, structure. We also found that the wall carries most of the load, which makes sense because it's the thickest element. And, and four, the lateral braces can provide substantially more rigidity, and therefore the connection between the wall post and the exterior post has structural significance. So our next steps for analysis will be to refine the material properties, to expand on the three-dimensional model that we talked about earlier, to model these wall-to-post connections based on the data that's uh, determined in the experimental test between New Notre Dame and New Mexico State, and then to finally refine the wind load analysis and continue to run multiple tests. And I just want to give a special thanks to Dr. Kevin Walsh and uh, PhD candidate Davin Fercio for all their help with modeling and troubleshooting issues. Thank you. All right, so unlike all my colleagues, I have no amazing results to present today. <laughs> Just some preliminary of what we're going to set up to do in, uh, in these wall tests. And uh, I definitely appreciate Liam's uh, enthusiasm and, and confidence, but I'm not sure we're going to be able to answer all those questions about connections just with these, these tests we're doing. Um, but we'll give you a, some idea of what we, we plan to do with these tests. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Eduardo Davila, and uh, he's our graduate student working on the project, and Dr. Paula Bendini at New Mexico State University. Um, she's a geotechnical engineer, which um, definitely plays an important role when we're looking at the behavior of adobe as we're talking about a soil that's acting as a structural material at this point. Right? So um, just about what I'm going to talk about today a little bit, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on some of the information and some of the previous tests that we've been doing at New Mexico State and kind of why the testing is important to what we're doing, and then kind of go into the test methods and experimental program that we'd like to do um, related to this project. So um, just to start out, we, we all know Adobe's structures have been around for thousands of years for a very long time. About a third of the world's population still lives in some type of earthen construction still today, right? So this is an important uh, project, essentially, not only from a historical point of view, but also going forward, right, as we, we continue to use this material, right? And if we look at codes today, um, so that have Adobe in them, they're very, very limited. So it's one of the lesser understood structural materials out there, um, especially when you compare things that you're looking at, things like concrete or steel design. So things that we're gonna gather from doing these simple walls that can actually help quite a bit develop these codes. Um, as most of the information right now is kind of passed down from generation to generation, and a lot of uh, what we're seeing is from observation and not really quantified out there. So this is, can provide us a lot of information um, for, like I said, both historical context, but also kind of as, as we move forward into to, to current construction methods. So a little bit of background about how I got into Adobe and, and what we're doing in New Mexico State. So we've been studying this um, Adobe wall properties for several years now, actually. So we've done a lot of wall tests, um, all very small scale wall tests, about quarter scale of a traditional um, historic structure in southwestern New Mexico. Uh, south, sorry, southwestern United States. Um, and you can kind of just kind of see what we're doing here. Everything is traditional construction, so um, we aren't using any additives other than natural fibers. Everything's compacted by hand, and everything we do is built in the lab. So you can kind of see here as we're building these walls. Okay. And again, these are, these are relatively small scale walls, um, but the scale for what we were studying is really important. But we are looking at the overall behavior of the system, and, and we're looking at the what design parameters really affect the behavior and the mechanisms of the behavior of the, of, of the, the walls, and how can we improve on those? Um, so, so these are some of the walls that we've tested, and everything we're testing is in the lateral direction right now. Right? So this is looking kind of like if you were to simulate an earthquake, um, what, are we, what are the behavior of that in that lateral direction? So this is our test setup here. Right? So what we're doing is just we have our wall here, and we just are pushing this in the monotonic direction. We're not cycling this. Um, and we're looking at the different parameters and overall behavior of the system um, to kind of get an idea of these behaviors. Some of the things that we're really focusing on is, one is just the moisture content of the adobe itself, right? So how does that affect the behavior? Because that is an important parameter in, in this. Um, but we're also looking at things like, how is the load transferred into this? This is actually something that is very important and how the overall behavior of that changes depending on how that load is transferred into the adobe. Um, so again, you can kind of just see the little small uh, walls and the test set up there and some of the instruments that we're looking at. 
We are measuring in-plane and out-of-plane direction, so we are looking at the wall out-of-plane direction, but we're not focusing the loads on that in that sense. So everything was just in the in-plane direction. And again, just another view of that. So uh, you can kind of see um, what the, the wall and the test setup looks like there. And I won't, I'm not going to show you a lot of results. I just wanted to kind of throw one of these results up here um, and I'll show you what we're looking at. So this is just looking at the load um, versus our in-plane direction. So we have our load and then the in-plane displacement of the wall. These are the, the three string pots on, the, on the, the, the edge of the wall there that's capturing the behavior. But what we're able to do with this is get our initial linear elastic stiffness. So we're able to get the behavior up till essentially the first crack occurs. Like, so we get that cracking load, which is important to know. But we are also able to get what happens post-cracking. So do we immediately fail or do we continue to have some strength, right? So we continue to see that we have some strength. And then within this, we can also identify like behavior mechanisms. Is it rocking? Is it sliding? Is it a combination of those? So and then so you can actually kind of see here, we initially we see some rocking in this particular case, then we have some sliding, and then ultimately we reached failure. So we can kind of see those mechanisms that are developing that past that post cracking and kind of get an, an idea of the behavior um, of, that we expect in these in these walls. Yeah. Um, so you can kind of see this is some of the, the during testing. If you look closely, you can see the crack right there is being formed. And then this is that failure. You can you can see that the failure crack. And if you notice, as typical with Mason reconstruction, the, we find that it follows the weakest link, and in this case, it's along the border lines, right? So, um, so that's the same that we kind of expect to see. And again, you can see that crack opening, and we can identify that first cracking, and then, and then um, what happens after that. Okay. So we did change the load um, transfer mechanism because we do think this is an important parameter. So we did change how we were we were implementing or applying that load. As you can see, we went from kind of an L-shaped beam here into just a straight bond beam on top. And push on it, and you can kind of see how things change just a little bit there um, as we as we applied those loads. So if you kind of compare, you can kind of see that load transfer mechanism does seem to play an important role in that. So these are a few things that we've been looking at um, with this uh, with this project. Um, you can also see not only are we we structural engineers, we're great artists. Um, we, we, into the wall there very nicely. Um, we were just doing some digital image correlation on this, uh, so that's why you just see that scanned and random, randomized pattern there. Um, but we did look at things like higher moisture contents. As I said, this is an important parameter um, within our, our, um, our research and the behavior of the structure. And we also looked at reinforcement as well. So with higher moisture, moisture contents, you see a greatly different behavior, right? Um, so it goes from a lot more less rocking to a lot more sliding and crushing when you have a higher moisture content, right? And so depending on what region you're in, in this could be an important parameter in how we expect the behavior of the, the system to, to uh, the, the structural system. Um, we also added reinforcement. With reinforcement, we can actually increase the strength quite significantly. So we looked at a lot of different parameters when, um, when we considered all of those different things. So just some more um, some pictures there. Well, how does this all apply to the Tumba building, which we're all here to discuss today, right? So we were able to use a lot of the data um, from the in-plane lateral load test, the material test that we've conducted at New Mexico State um, to input parameters for the Adobe portion of the wall. But one of the things that's really not well understood is that out-of-plane behavior still. Like there's not a lot of information on that out-of-plane behavior. And as Liam just pointed out, really this wall seems to be carrying a lot of that load. Right? So it's a very important parameter in understanding that. And so what we want to do is do some scaled tests on this to kind of identify the behavior of that out-of-plane wall. Okay. And so again, we're going to be focusing just on a section, a small section of this. So and one of the things that I'd like to point out is it's not a perfectly exact test. We know that. We're just looking to identify kind of key variables. One of the things that we're not going to be including in this, and so I just want to point this out, is we know that there is this, this stone rubble masonry at the bottom of this. Um, we won't be looking at that particular, we'll just be focusing on just the top portion there of the adobe wall. Okay? Um, just due to time constraints, money, um, getting everything done, it's just not feasible to include both of them at this point. But that could be something we add at, the, at a later stage. A okay? um, couple other things that we're going to consider is we'll, we will look at this the transfer of this, the loads through that interior post. 
And then we'll look at also what happens when we add this frame um, post or this veranda post in the back side. Okay. So the research that we were we were hoping to look at was just kind of understand the strength characteristics of the Adobe wall system itself, right? And understand that interaction with the Adobe wall and that frame system, right? Um, and some provide some experimental data in, to improve the model. So that particularly that out of plane behavior because that is an important parameter. Right? And then identify key components of the wall system for further investigation. Like I said, these are going to be small scale systems. And so hopefully with this, we'll be able to identify key things that really need to be studied that can influence the overall strength of the system. So that's one of the things that we hope to come out of it. Okay. So our test methods, okay? so we're going to be doing approximately one third scale Adobe bricks and walls, right? uh, which is going to be a mixture of natural soil and, and poorly graded sand um, and uh, hand mixed with cut straw. Uh, the straw is just there to help facilitate the drying properties. Right, so it just helps to create a more evenly dried brick with less cracks, which is, which is what we want. Um, everything is done manually. We mix manually. We compact everything in, uh, with our fists and wooden molds to form the bricks. And then we sun dry them for at least uh, a week. And in Mexico, we can typically get away with about a week when it's already 100 degrees there right now. Okay. Um, so this is the traditional method of, of making Adobe. So we follow that same method when we're looking at this behavior right now. So these are some of the, the bricks that we had made for the previous test. We'll do something um, similar for these. These are a little bit smaller than what we'll be using for the one third scale um, bricks. And one thing to point out, we will also test material properties, but the compressive strength we really don't think is the biggest concern, right? We think it's that mortar interaction, kind of that behavior, the, the initial crack in that out of plane direction. So the, while we'll get the overall strength characteristics of the material, we don't think that's going to be the, the really defining um, defining behavior that we're, we're needing. So this is just a basic setup. Um, so again, we just have our, our Adobe wall there. Right? Um, we will add our frame onto this. And this will be how we will load the wall. So we'll actually be applying the load right here at the top and then transfer the load all in through the, the post, the interior post adjacent to into the wall. Um, and like I said, we'll also kind of mimic this portion of the, of the, the frame system. So we'll have a, a second frame representing that random frame um, in the back there, right? And so we'll be doing something very similar. We'll have these embedded, scaled embedment as well as the base. And while I, like I said, we know it's not the exact uh, load mechanism and, and transfer of forces that we expect, as this isn't quite where it would be, it would give us a very good idea of how that frame system interacted and kind of key components of that um, system and, and the effect that it has on it. And so um, the matrix that we're looking to do, um, we have four essentially um, tests that we're, we're looking to run. Um, the first would just be that individual frame. So even before we put the Adobe wall in, we'd like to just look at this interior frame right here. So we can just load this, get the linear elastic behavior of that, and kind of give us just its overall strength without any wall or second, the exterior post of that frame system behind it. Okay. Um, the second test we'd like to add is just the frame with the veranda uh, frame. So this interior frame, and then this this frame out here, so this connection as well. So with, again, without the Adobe wall, um, what happens when we have that type of a system? How large of an increase is that? Um, kind of giving us an idea of how important that second frame or that frame system would become um, in that case. Um, then we would look at this, the individual frame with the Adobe wall. So we have this frame here, we'd add the Adobe wall into it, right? And just look at that load transfer into the wall and the overturning effects in that out of plane direction of the wall. And then finally, um, we'd add everything together. So we'd have the, the Adobe wall, the frame, and the veranda frame as well. Right? So it kind of looks at everything independently and then everything together. Right? It kind of hopefully gives an idea of, of all the interactions between everything. I would like to add a fifth one if we have time, but we don't know. And I think my, my student will um, quit if I keep adding more to him. But if I have the time and funding and availability, we will just do one Adobe wall as well, just looking at the pushover of that. Um, but again, I don't know if Eduardo's on today. He might he might be resigning right now if he hears that. 
Um, so, so with this, what we're wanting to do is again just identify some of our, our key elements of the system. Um, you know, what's what's really important? What things do we need to keep to keep studying, um, both experimentally and analytically? Um, we want to improve the understanding of the behavior of the Adobe wall and that interaction with the frame. So, looking at things like that transfer the load. Um, can we kind of identify some of those post boundary conditions? Is it more towards the fixed ends? Is it more towards the, the pin connection? Right, so hopefully we'll get a little bit more insight into that. And this will all go into the models and help to improve those modeling assumptions and, and give us a better overall result um, as in, in Liam's model as somebody takes that on. And then eventually if we have, have the capability, you know, move to half scale and full scale testing, you know, we can, we can create these where we actually started putting the rubble at the foundation. Right, we can include a more accurate frame system. Um, and then we can create finite element models to assess any scaling effects and just kind of keep refining those models as we can, we look, uh, we continue to go on. And then again, these connections, these are important things. So how are these tight connections with their stiffness? How much rotation do they allow? And things like that. Those are some of the stuff that we can, um, you know, continue to work on in the future as, as the project continues. So with that, I believe I turn it back over to Alessandro. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. So to conclude this colloquium, thank you all for your uh, patience. If they summarize our main assumptions, as well as uh, some of our main findings and uh, their significance to this research. Now, there are, as you, can, as you have seen, uh, many, many unknowns concerning the structure of the Tumba building. And as a result, we had to make several assumptions in our study, most of which, not all of which, but most of the significant ones concerned the connections between members of the structure. Now, beginning with timber to timber connections, there is no evidence of metal nails of the Tumba building. Uh, joints were possibly or probably made by means of lashings, as is typical in hut construction to this day, or were pegged mortise and tenon joints, or a combination of the two, very likely. Um, after all, lashed joints uh, were common in Mediterranean ship building throughout the Bronze and Early Iron Age, and were still used by Greek shipwrights in the Archaic period in combination with pegged mortise and tenon joints, as exemplified by this famous wreck, the Jules Verne uh, wrecks found at Marseille, uh, and dating to the middle or second half of the 6th century, according to Marcus Comey. Uh, we assumed that the timber-to-timber -timber joints would not broken under load, but in fact we don't know how strong these joints were or how quickly and to what extent they may have loosened up over time. Now ideally, as a future step of our study, we would like to conduct experimental tests on lashed and pegged joints to refine our approach. Just as importantly, we don't know how firmly the building's posts were fixed uh, in the were fixed in the ground. Uh, they were buried very buried very deeply compared to other posts from contemporary or later Greek buildings. But even if the refill in the post spits was packed very tightly, it surely had loosened up over time as the buried wood decayed. Now a decay of wood, uh, buried wood of course with exposure to oxygen, moisture and living organisms. As the timber posts decayed inside the pit, the fill around them would have settled and become less compact, with the post of ground joints becoming gradually more loose. In general, depending on wood species and the ground's moisture regime, timber posts typically need replacing every 20 to 30 years. Now, we know that the ceramic finds associated with the tumba building and the fact that its floor was not heavily trodden suggests that the building lasted a relatively short time. Surely, if I may use that term, no more than a half century, 
and according to most scholars, no more than a quarter of a century, and probably less, much less. But we don't know exactly how many years. We also have the plaster cast of the buried end of post C4 here, at the bottom right corner of the slide, and it tapered towards the bottom. Now, perhaps this was a result of decay. However, this could also be the original shape of the base of the trunk as a result of being cut with a not-too-sharp axe or a stone tool, as experimental archaeology uh, demonstrates. And naturally, a combination of this and decay is more than plausible. Uh, coming to our main findings. Modern scholars tend to underestimate the structural capacity of uh, primitive structures in the perishable materials, and we did too, I confess, at the beginning of this study. But along the way, we discovered a degree of structural sophistication in the design of the tomb of building that shows that its structural layout was well thought out and capable of withstanding considerable loads. Our structural analysis against gravity and wind loads shows that the peripteral accounts, I reminded, uh, for the cross alignment of the posts better than the non peripteral alternative, was structurally sound, even with the heaviest possible gravity load, the thick coat of reeds weighing 70 kilograms per square meter. This considerable structural strength was due to the geometry of the structure and to the ability of the timber frame to transfer part of the vertical and horizontal loads to the mud brick walls. Now again, our next experiments will help us refine our understanding of how the transfer mechanisms mechanism occurred. Our approach thus far was very conservative. We always went for a worst case scenario. Because of course, if we can demonstrate something in the worst case scenario, then that's all the more, that all the more is valid in any other possible scenario. In addition to demonstrating that the original construction, uh, reconstruction is structurally sound, our study has demystified the structural purpose of some of the, the, the building's main components. Now, to begin with, the mud brick wall, as Liam observed, carried most of the vertical load and was also very important for withstanding the horizontal thrusts associated with wind and buckling and possibly earthquakes. Earthquake is something we, we haven't uh, got into uh, to this point, but it would be one of the uh, natural outcomes of uh, one of the next steps of this, of this uh, project. Second, the wall posts were essential for transferring those, these horizontal thrusts from the frame to the wall, as uh, outlined in, uh, uh, by, by Brett Weldon. Uh, their orientation with the long side of their cross sections parallel to the wall ensured the, the largest possible contact area between frame components and wall. Our next experiments with mud brick masonry will enable us to refine our understanding of how forces were transferred from the frame to the wall. And third, the exterior posts. Uh, notice that I, I haven't called them uh, veranda posts up to this moment, but because we uh, have uh, confidently demonstrated that the structure of the veranda uh, was, uh, uh, it is uh, realistic, feasible, a stand structure examination, then uh, I will now take the leisure of calling them veranda posts. <laughs> In addition to carrying the veranda roof, they also played an important structural role at a more general level. By this, I do not mean that the veranda had a primarily structural purpose. No, it, it created a usable covered space, and it may have been meant to enhance the grandeur of the building, possibly. But at the same time, our analysis shows that the exterior posts help, help enhance the global rigidity of the structure. As noted, their consistent alignment with the wall posts suggests a direct structural connection. And our study asked if there would have been any compelling reason for this connection. And we found 
Uh, the lateral braces, those horizontal lateral connections, uh, could add significant stiffness. Turning, in, in the, turning each couple of aligned posts and the rafters over the veranda into a sort of buttressing system. Now, their effect would have been the, uh, the more important, the less firmly the posts were fixed to the ground. As I noted earlier, a post set in the ground tends to rot as the bur at the buried end over a period of uh, 20 to 30 years on average, after which the buried end is completely crumbled and the post is not fixed to the ground anymore. Now, because decay is a gradual process, the base joints, the, the base, base joint tends to loosen more and more over time, so that the buttress effect of the connected wall posts and exterior posts would have become more and more important for stability over time. Now, if this interpretation is correct, then the structural design <coughs> of the tumba building suggests that it was probably built to last at least as long as its materials would allow, even as the base joints became less effective. Now, our study has addressed important questions concerning the design and structural behavior of the Tumba building, but other significant questions remain open, such as, as Irene Limos uh, pointed out at the beginning of this colloquium, what functions it served and how long it functioned. Our study, uh, I don't believe we can answer these questions, although the level of structural, sorry, the level of structural sophistication we observed seems to suggest to some degree that the building was not conce conceived as a purely temporary structure. Uh, the two main hypotheses on the building's function are, uh, I reminded, that the building was the dwelling or the seat of a local prince, then when the prince died, it became his burial and was dismantled and filled to form the burial mound. Alternatives, as Mavin uh, Popham and Jim Colton and many other scholars uh, have maintained, uh, that it was conceived and built as a memorial for Heron only after the prince died, and then sometime later it was dismantled to create the funeral mound. A question about this second theory is why, at some point, the community's attitudes towards this uh, heron uh, changed as they decided to turn it into a mound. Uh, now, it is possible that the building suffered structural damage. Uh, it has been uh, proposed, uh, uh, but this is not certain at all. It's just one uh, hypothesis. Uh, as a matter of fact, Jim Colton observed that the, the, another as, as plausible possibility is that the, uh, the structural damage, which in fact uh, had been observed in some very secondary walls, not in the long walls that one would expect would have failed uh, under a seismic action, or at least failed first, uh, that, that, that damage could have been created that while the building was being dismantled. So we cannot assume that the building suffered structural damage. But even if the building suffered structural damage, scholars have asked why it was not repaired rather than dismantled and filled, which required, as has been observed today, a substantially larger investment. Now, our consideration of material durability may be of some relevance to this change of attitudes. Whether or not the building suffered damage, its posts would have rotten after uh, no more than 30 years. Now, keeping the building alive would have entailed not just repair, but replacing the posts and the substantial work of completely rebuilding the roof carried by those posts. And the roof itself would have needed retouching after about the same amount of time. In short, as imposing and structurally sophisticated as it was, the Tumba building, just like any other building of wood and touch, could not exceed the durability of its materials. And then rather than a change in attitudes, the decision to transform it into a mound may rather be seen as acceptance of the natural end of its life cycle, while at the same time the community continued to celebrate the place as lieu de mémoire 
a place of enduring significance for the community. This concludes our talks and uh, that I would like to dedicate to the memory of my mentor and dear friend Jim Colton. Uh, um, I hope it's not too disappointed that uh, what uh, uh, we have done. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, I would like to open up the uh, panel discussion and field any questions uh, from our panelists uh, in Zoom and for, uh, from our uh, audience in person, both in person and uh, remote. Thank you. So we will now uh, read some of the uh, the questions that were asked in the Q and A and in the chat. Margot, I will ask your uh, assistance. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not sure. <coughs> do people want to ask their own questions, or shall I just read out what was? Oh, maybe. Uh, but for the the people who have access to do the panelists, uh, maybe they they would like to use their own voice. But I, I believe that John Benfleet is following us in remote. So why don't you please go okay. ahead, Margot, and sure. read the question. So uh, John has just uh, said, as most analysts consider that the structure was not intended as a long-term domestic structure, but as a tomb resembling an el elite residence elsewhere, is it perhaps a false assumption that it was built to normal housing standards and not as a ceremonial burial structure for a short life? Thus, its strength may not have been a consideration. Uh, I think that's a, I, I will uh, start answering this question. I think this is a very crucial question. Th I thank John Bindley for asking this question. Uh, can you uh, keep it up? Uh, oh, sure. Thank you. Uh, I totally agree that if the structure, and I'm not assuming that, and I'm not assuming this, but if the structure was not planned, was not conceived uh, to last for a long time, if it was, I mean, conceived to be temporary, which is not the same uh, as saying that it just didn't last for a long time. But if it was really conceived from the beginning to be purely temporary, it had lasted a day, a week, a month, uh, then it is, I, I think it makes a lot of sense to uh, uh, imagine that probably the standards would not have been so, standards in terms of, for example, the thickness of the, uh, of the straw coats, coats which means the waterproofing uh, standard of the roof, maybe those standards would not have been as high as for a real house. Although I have to uh, remind that, that the, uh, the, 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 the audience, that the, the building did accommodate uh, foodstuffs, at least for some time, because they were pitoi in the, in the apps, uh, and those usually accommodate the foodstuffs. But anyway, uh, it, it is reasonable to, uh, Imagine that the build the possibility at least to admit the possibility that, that the standards were not so high as for construction that were meant to last for a considerably longer time. I totally agree with this point. How high were the standards of the construction of the Tumba building? How uh, thick was the load of the touch coat? How thick were the rafters? and so forth. Now, these are some of the many uh, questions that uh, came up uh, at some point uh, along the way as we were conducting, uh, conducting our research. Uh, and I have to say that uh, we don't have the answers, uh, but at every bifurcation in the research process, we consistently chose the worst case scenario, which means the scenario in which the loads were as high as possible, and the structure was as weak as possible. So worst case scenario and the rationale behind that is that if we can uh, demonstrate, if the structure stands uh, ex examination, if the, if, the structure, if the structure is sound, in the worst case scenario, then all the more reason that the other possible variation would have been structurally sound. So that was not our, our approach. I hope that this answers the, this important question. We do have some hands up as well. Oh, please, um, yeah. Should we respond? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, a ladies. Uh, a ladies, yes. yes. Let, please, a ladies. <laughs> You just wanted to remark on this. I, I wrote it also in the chat. Is uh, that you know we shouldn't forget that this is this was a. Brist 
prestige thing. And so this could mean that even if it was meant to last only for a short time, it may have been built according to the best standards because they, it had to impress the other people uh, who came who came to the funeral and and uh, you know were witnessing the building. So I, I think it's a good point uh, that John Bentliff made. But um, you know we should also consider that it may really have been built as a strong building for that reason. Thank you, ladies. And if I may uh, add uh, uh, to that, uh, one could ask. Uh, what is, where is the point of all this analysis, uh, such, such a no, overkilling, we might call it, if the structure could have been just a temporary one? It, it's, it, you know, I agree with the ladies that there are assumptions uh, inside the question. Uh, but anyway, even if we assume it uh, as is, uh, I, I think that the uh, the analysis here, a comprehensive, uh, thorough structural <coughs> analysis, was all the more uh, interesting here in this particular case because we did we, we should not make the assumption that it was conceived to last for a short time. Maybe it lasted for a very short time, but not necessarily was it designed to last for a short time. So wh why is this relevant? Because if we if the analysis had turned out to uh, demonstrate that the building was definitely not up to standards. It was definitely not up to, it was not able to withstand the very considerable load of 70 kilograms per square meters that Herd assumed. Uh, we, we really wanted to, 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 to try the Herd's way first. Uh, and, and if that was true, and if the building, as important, uh, if the building had uh, turned out not to be able to withstand a breeze or an average uh, wind pressure from an average wind speed, then this would have been an independent suggestion, if not indication, that the building was not designed, was actually designed to be temporary. Uh, but this didn't turn out to be the case. As a matter of fact, the building, uh, we, we can confidently say that in our, even though we considered all uh, worst case conditions, we were always very conservative, over conservative in some cases, the structure was pretty sophisticated. And it, even, even according to modern standards, uh, I would say, uh, that the structure will probably pass uh, a, a, an engineer's uh, a, a test according to modern codes. Uh, um, Irene was uh, probably. I see the hand. Yes, am I? Uh, am I? Can you hear me? So, uh, just to to, can you hear me? Because I cannot see myself now. Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Good. Great. Great. So, um, just a, 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 a small comment that we have to consider our concept of time, because what we consider time today. It might not have been the same in antiquity. I mean, 30 years in antiquity, it's a very long time, I think. So <laughs> it is important to remember that they probably might have planned to last for a generation or two. And uh, this is something that we need to consider. Also, it is actually quite uh, important to remember that uh, the few pots that have been found in the building, very few indeed, the ones that they were found in the filling in and the earliest posts from the cemetery belong chronologically to the same pottery sequence. So, you know, the, 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 the events that took place, you know, the construction, uh, abandonment, filling in and start using the Tumba Cemetery, with, it is within one potter's generation uh, when we talk about pottery sequences. And this is the only way we can date, of course, uh, uh, this, uh, these sequences uh, based on, on, on the pottery sequences we have at the building. So th this, is, uh, this is quite important to remember. This was uh, a building which for one or the other reason didn't last long. So it's quite important to see what happened, uh, why it was destroyed and why it was abandoned and filled in. And uh, the other thing is that I'm glad to hear that you are going to look at earthquakes because I must say that uh, I've been, I have spent now 40 years of my life in Lefkandi every summer 
or if they're not 40, they're 35. And uh, in August, uh, we don't have meltemia. And uh, what we do have is terrestrial rain. And somebody, I think it was Lena that mentioned the importance of the rain. And we do have earthquakes as well. So I think it will be very interesting to see how these two uh, could affect uh, the stability of the building as well. I'm surprised that uh, you got uh, your uh, kind of uh, winds uh, references from the Tanagra base, which is actually an area where we, we have one of the most important air, uh, air bases in Greece. So I'm surprised that they chosen place for their air base where they have uh, strong winds. So uh, I don't know whether that happened once or twice. In, in the history of Danagra. But uh, I must say, I have not experienced Meltemi. The Eubean Gulf is more like a lake rather than, uh, you know, the Aegean in the Cyclades. So I would very welcome if you look uh, in uh, other kind of reasons that uh, might affect it, the stability of the building. Thank you, Irina. The, the earthquake is definitely one of our next, uh, uh, next uh, goal, next uh, stages. Uh, but uh, rain, uh, uh, torrential rain, is also something we should definitely look into. Thank you very much. Uh, um, I think there's uh, Donald uh, Haggis, uh, the Nancy Klein. Donald, welcome. Yeah, thank you, and for um, inviting my participation. Although <laughs> I'm neither an architect nor an engineer, um, but I uh, I found the presentation uh, um, persuasive. I do think that the uh, um, the idea, of course, would would follow with what John Bitliff said and and uh, and the DNA analytics um, about um, about the the sort of the cultural aspects, the the ideas of both temporality and also intentionality, because we're not we're not entirely sure about uh, about function. And I would also argue it just against the DNA a little bit about chronology. Um, because uh, chronology based on the pottery is only going to be a residue uh, of whatever the functions were within that temporal frame. So there are some problems there. But but what 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 came to mind in listening to your to your presentation is that um, if if what you model is this structural durability uh, over let's say a generation, that might give us some room to begin considering. Um, uh, different aspects of um, uh, of cultural meaning and cultural context. Uh, so, um, if if we know that the building could have stood, let's say for for a generation, then within the you know within the context of of the mortuary ritual, within the context of the use of cemetery space as a means of expressing. Uh, uh, intergenerational relationships or intergenerational power hierarchies, then that I think could, um, you know, very usefully inflect the uh, uh, inflect the discussion. Um, although we we do have to keep in mind that um, that, that the cultural process of building, um, as Hadini suggested, even even a even a permanent uh, structure. Um, is a, is a form of, in a sense, cultural engagement that doesn't necessarily predict that it was meant to stand um, and meant to be visible or meant to be used. That's simply our assumption um, that, that a permanent building should be then used permanently or <laughs> indefinitely. Um, so um, so it, it's quite possible that the, the the cultural process of building was to make a permanent structure. Then there, then that was immediately uh, dismantled and buried. Um, so there, there's always that there's always that possibility. But the fact that it could have been visible and could have been durable for let's say a generation it does give us you know does give us some some really firm groundwork for considering its role as an artifact as part of the mortuary process. Uh, this is very fascinating, Donald. And I think this, uh, your, your observation uh, could uh, open up some interesting uh, avenues of uh, further inquiry. Uh, the uh, relationship of the life cycle of a building 
with the attached roof and posts set in the ground, and the life cycle pass me the question of a person or a family. I, I think I find it very, very interesting as it, as you said, uh, potentially ties the intergenerational memory uh, to to the matter of, of the building. And as a matter of fact, each generation, if you inherited a house from your, your parents uh, or from your larger uh, family, a uh, group uh, or king group, at some point during your life, uh, if you, uh, unless you, you didn't uh, happen to live, uh, 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 if, if, you, if you died, yeah, of course, <laughs> uh, but uh, you would have had to reconstruct it at least once in your lifetime. And as uh, Anthony Snodgrass uh, hypothesized that the life cycle of uh, an 8th century person, not necessarily elite person, just uh, an average uh, life uh, uh, duration, would have been around 25 to 30 uh, years. Uh, comparable to that of any uh, wooden post buried in the ground. And I, I touched upon this uh, problem, the relationship of the care caring for a building uh, and the life cycle of a gen life of a generation, generation span. Uh, in, in my forthcoming book, uh, The Origins of Greek Temple Architecture, uh, I only touched upon it though, and that there's a conversation is uh, all ahead of us. Uh, one of the things that I found, found to be potentially interesting is uh, uh, that you know, when temples become a widespread phenomenon in Greece in the uh, second half of the uh, 8th century BC, many of them uh, across Greece, uh, especially in uh, uh, mainland Greece, had uh, posts in the ground and also thatched roofs. Uh, so they wouldn't have lasted unless periodically <laughs> reconstructed. So I asked the question, uh, was periodical reconstruction something that had a uh, uh, community engagement, okay, most probably, but was it something that had a ritual meaning in the context of uh, uh, religious uh, ritual? It's a possibility. For example, that, that, that calls to mind a, a passage of the Iliad where uh, Croesus uh, uh, prays to Apollo. Uh, the, the Achaeans uh, just uh, kidnapped or stole his, uh, his, his daughter. And he, uh, he asks Apollo to help me, to bring her back. If, on, if ever I, uh, uh, I roofed a temple or, uh, or burned sacrifices to you. Now, the act uh, is observed by uh, Barter Burkett in, in an, an essay in 1991, I believe. Uh, this might literally mean the repeated uh, periodical act of re- uh, building, re-roofing re, re, re a temple. And the word is re-roofing in translation, of course, not rebuilding. It's a precise word, or at least I think it is. Uh, and uh, uh, because touch lasted, the, you have to retouch a building, at least the, 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 uh, the, the top of the roof every seven to nine years. So it was a pretty uh, constant uh, maintenance that was required. So was, did it have a ritual uh, significance or did it have it in some, for some communities? Uh, there is uh, Nancy Klein and uh, Sam Holtzman, Holtz Cotton, I see there. Okay. It's raised. Also have some questions in the chat as well, so I don't know if we wanna... Uh, I think we should first uh, take them from the live sure. uh, uh, panelist and then we'll... we'll I, I would just like to express my gratitude to Alessandro for inviting um, us to participate in this. And I'm going to echo something that um, Professor Hasselberger has noted in the chat that you have brought together a very impressive interdisciplinary approach. And so I applaud the individuals, the teams and the institutions for offering their support for this enterprise. Thank you. <laughs> In addition, um, as somebody who focuses on architecture of both the Bronze Age and the historical period, I truly appreciate showcasing the contribution of the architecture. You are interrogating the remains, the physical remains of the building, and modeling methods whereby we can assess various properties 
Too often we rely on a plan and a reconstruction without actually querying the validity. Um, we're, we're, we are guilty of doing this because it's difficult to answer these questions. And so I'm just going to pivot briefly to say that you will find in the chat, and I think in the Q&A, um, a lot of people who have thought about this and are going to add other elements to the discussion. Have you considered this in how you evaluate wind shear? Have you considered the way that weather contributes to load? And I guess my, my final comment would be an expression of the hope that you continue to use these models, that you expand the list of variables that are considered um, and use your own personal understanding of how vernacular and historic traditions in the architecture of Greece, pre-monumental and monumental, um, the evidence that we have, the range of possibilities and explore how this allows us to, again, to interrogate the architecture and allow it to address these other issues such as culture, such as lifespan, such as life history, um, and the fact that it's not a static structure or process. It's very much a part of the living experience of how people use those buildings. So again, thank you. This has been a wonderful experience. Thank you so much. Uh, coming from you, it means uh, a lot, uh, Nancy. You also teach at a school of architecture, I, I, I understand. So uh, you, you have a, a very... Uh, uh, closer relationship with uh, uh, architects and uh, you know I, I would really like to continue the conversation with you and with our uh, panelists and we the, 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 the attendees in zoom uh, some of the further components the further uh, factors um, would include uh, as I was reading in the chat the snow is there any snow we will have to if so uh, we will have to factor that uh, we would also, and the, you know, the, the, we didn't really uh, get into the details of the wind analysis, uh, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, uh, but um, so the is uh, my my colleagues have been explaining to me for a long time until I finally understood a fraction of it. Uh, what might have been even more uh, 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 dangerous for the uh, for the stability of this building was probably not the. The, the pressure, the constant pressure, the wind, but isolated events of the uh, uh, kicks of uh, you know gusts uh, of wind uh, in the, the the periodical uh, the, the the periodicity if that's a word of those kicks uh, may have uh, in in uh, set in in place in motion a an oscillation a, a back and forth uh, pendular movement. That is has been known to have caused the failure of important bridges, for example. So, it is uh, more complex than uh, than we were able to uh, to present it in a short time. Uh, but uh, absolutely, there are many more factors that we would like to uh, to uh, to explore in the in the near future. Um, by the way, uh, we, we're opening up the, our uh, uh, fundraise campaign for the. <laughs> the next stages of the of the of the building uh thank you uh, sam holzman and then uh, paul scotton is a see um thank you thank you very much for for the invitation to join for 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 this event today um i want to echo something that that Nancy just said and, and which is sort of a, a a broad thank you and and also a congratulations on what's been a sort of really inspiring presentation of a collaborative interdisciplinary project um, I think that this the, the presentations today have really highlighted the limitations of our tendency to look at buildings and plan. In part, this is how archaeologists find things. Um, but 2D top-down analysis of buildings pushes us towards certain interpretations that often emphasize issues of orientation and how they relate to the compass rows, rising and setting suns, views of things on the environment. Uh, uh, views of things on the horizon, and that aspects of climate and environment are too often a blind spot for archaeologists, especially foreign excavators who often only see their sites for a few weeks um, in July and have never seen their site uh, with snow on the ground. 
uh, and that during the historical period, our sources make absolutely clear, whether it's buildings like the Tower of the Winds or the second half of the first book of Vitruvius, that wind and, and other climatic and environmental factors were central considerations in all building and urban design. Um, this didn't just uh, uh, factor into things like uh, the structural feasibility of, of, of buildings, but issues of health and illness and, and community well-being generally. And so I think that this project has been really exciting to see because it has visualized and made real invisible forces that are often difficult for archaeologists to imagine, but were strongly felt by ancient builders. And um, this emphasis on the importance of visualization, I think, is also drawn out by um, the fact that this project has highlighted the interrelationship between um, the practice of drawing reconstructions and of interpreting sites. Um, and in many ways, the central testament of a lot of this is to Jim Colton's integrated skills as a draftsman and as an architectural historian. It's a testament to his drawings here that three decades later, we'll, we're still grappling with the way in which he framed this question. So bravo to you all. Thank you, Sam. And I, I have really, we, we, the, the only, we can only, we can do this. We, we have been able to do this, to, do this, to push this uh, examination to the limits that we have been able to explore because the work of the British team, uh, Marvin, directed by Marvin Popham and uh, of uh, Jim Colton in Primis was so thorough, so meticulous. Uh, so I have to thank all of them, all of the excavators who have preceded us and the current excavator, Irene Limos. Limos in, uh, so thank you all, thanks Sam for making this important point. Um, we have uh, Paul Scotton in the in order and then a ladies, Antoine de Morton. Um, I too would like to echo all of the thanks to you, Alessandro, and all of the presenters. I mean, this has got me thinking in many, many different directions. I posed a question in the chat, but I wanted to, in, you know, not cut in line, but I wanted to respond to the issues raised about earthquakes. Um, one, I would like to say that lashing of post and beams is really actually a very smart solution in earthquake country, because what we're learning the hard way is that trying to outmuscle earthquakes is not entirely successful, and flexibility is actually a plus. And if you've lashed your posts and beams, you can then give and take with conditions coming in. So I, I think this is something to consider um, a little more. Um, I also think that the wind studies have been extremely uh, revelatory for us. And um, I keep thinking of analogies to boats where what you wanna do if you're in heavy seas is you point your bow forward and ride that way because the worst thing that happens is a wind coming in at the side because then you roll. And I'm wondering about some of the wind studies here and that it may not be that the 90 degree angle is the most detrimental. And this is where my questions about eaves and soffits came up in that with that low hanging eave like that, I really wonder if that doesn't, if you've got say a 60 degree angle, start manufacturing turbulence. And then you've got the whole length of the building acting as a wind tunnel and magnifying it and being pulled along sort of by the Venturi effect. I would love to see some modeling to see what's really going on with those eaves. Um, so throwing something out, which is certainly beyond my capabilities, but I'm going to watch eagerly for results. So. Thank you, Paul. Uh, these are all very excellent points. Uh, the lashings, we, we, we should uh, really get into the, uh, the, the, the specifics of how tight, uh, how, what kinds of uh, fibers was this uh, broom? Uh, Spartan was this uh, was this uh, flax, which uh, was was endemic to our areas of, of uh, continental Greece. Uh, those are all all, all uh, factors that are, are, would be 
in fact, of, of enormous importance to testing the behavior of the building even further. Analogy of boats, I always found, found it very fascinating. And that's why some time ago I joined, uh, you, you were so kind as to welcome me in the uh, maritime archaeology archaeology uh, group of the uh, the IA, uh, a, uh, the Archaeolog Archaeological Institute of America. I hope the conversation goes goes forward. Uh, now, the uh, uh, speaking of the roof angle and the turbulence uh, associated with the the flow uh, around this uh, this this uh, uh, section uh, section of the building, uh, we as uh, Gianluca Blois uh, 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 explained that uh, in the uh, experiments the uh, uh, wind tunnel experiments uh, considered uh, three parametric variations. Uh, 40, 45, and 50. Now, we haven't used that data, we haven't, we are in the process, in the process of processing that data, understanding what they mean. Uh, was a 40 degree uh, roof pitch much better in terms of uh, wind uh, behavior than, uh, than 45? Was 50 much more adverse a scenario? And, and, and then we would ideally go up to 60 and see what happens and see what kind of turbulence the eaves experience. Uh, by the way, uh, the, the, uh, the while the, the the models, the physical models that we used for the wind tunnel experiments were a little simplified. They didn't have the posts. Uh, the numerical model was uh, perfectly uh, uh, adherent to the to what we <laughs> imagined this building could have been. Even the posts, the thinnest posts, were uh, modeled. And so they're, they're, uh, the effect of the wind on, on those components has been considered. Um, I, if, if I may, I, I thought I spotted that on the screen with the numerical modeling, that there was some turbulence at the eaves. But I would really um, be curious as to what goes farther up in the eaves. Um, I'm also curious, I understand why Jim terminated mm -hmm. the eaves at the exterior post. But I also wonder if it may be that the eaves continued farther. Those are all things that we should consider now where further parametric variations uh, going on. So all duly noted, then I, I, I hope you, uh, all of you don't mind if we will reach out to you to consider to continue the conversation. Now I believe uh, Aledis and then uh, Andonis Cotonas. No. Yes, thank you very much. I, I also want to second uh, what Nancy was saying. I think this is just fantastic that you've put together this uh, interdisciplinary team to do a really structural analysis of how these buildings work. And talking now as a maritime archaeologist, I mean, this is what has started to happen in maritime archaeology uh, some decades ago. And it has really been very enlightening for our understanding of uh, ancient and medieval ships. Um, talking about which, um, I was one, I, I want to point out that in ships we have we have very very seldom do we have the masts preserved, but we do have a few examples of masts from ancient and medieval ships, and these masts taper to the bottom. They taper to the bottom from about deck level, and then at deck level they're braced horizontally by um, cross beams, and then uh, that's where they're at the widest. And then they taper again towards the top, following the natural taper of, of the mast. And that makes me wonder why, uh, in the analysis, if I understood them correctly, why the, um, the effect of the horizontal roof beams has not been considered. Uh, I mean, these roof beams, if they're indeed anchored on, uh, on top of vaults, uh, and um, they could have braced the, uh, the uprights, and that would have done a lot to uh, resist buckling and to also resist the sheer force on uh, the structure if the wind came from, from um, you know, not a 90 degree angle, but like a 45 degree angle. Uh, because that way you would have a much stronger frame. The whole building would have been, would have had a much, much stronger frame, which could have moved also uh, together and would have also made it strong. Uh, in term in uh, in um, times of earthquakes, uh, and then an other consideration I had is I wonder if you have uh, wondered if the roof could have actually the building could have actually been lower, uh, because 
you know, you could, you, uh, people didn't have to enter from um, on the south. They didn't have to enter. Um, I mean, you, you uh, actually could have gone all the way down to the bottom, which is what what we what uh, is thought um, uh, happened in 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 uh, prehistoric buildings in northern Europe. Um, but uh, uh, you could have opening uh, where the entrance was. You could have an opening in the veranda. Uh, and a higher a higher uh, opening there. Clearly, you could the roof could have been lower as long as people could have entered through the mud wall uh, without bending down. Um, and those are my two questions. Ladies, thank you. Those are all. Uh, I, I agree completely. I couldn't agree more. Uh, now, horizontal roof beams. I, I think you 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 mean those. Uh, Beams, uh, uh, cross lines, cross beams, it would have uh, uh, been carried by the adobe walls. Uh, right. Now, absolutely, yes, those would have uh, offered, they could have offered a tremendous uh, a contribution to the stiffness of the structure. Uh, now, again, uh, we refrained from uh, uh, accepting the help of those additional components because first we wanted to see if the structure failed naked as it was when uh, Jim first uh, conceived that reconstructed it based on the evidence. And then again, that we, we did so because we, we found that to be, we considered that to be the most economical in terms of uh, <coughs> assumptions. Whatever is not, uh, all, all that Jim uh, hypothesized is either testified by, by the evidence or it's unavoidable. It's necessary structurally. You cannot have a roof without rafters. We can blah blah blah. Uh, but the other components we refrain from uh, accepting their uh, potential help because first we wanted to see if the structure, the naked structure, could survive, and it did, it does survive. Fortunately, I have to say, <laughs> otherwise we would have probably delayed this uh, this uh, colloquium. <laughs> but uh, the, those components would certainly have. Uh, 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 considerably affected the behavior of the building. Uh, for example, the crosswise uh, uh, the, the, uh, the beam uh, would probably have would have divided the the length of the post, the height of the post, the effective length by half. Mm -hmm. And that because the the, the critical bugging though the, the changes with the second power of length, you, know, you can imagine how how how. Uh, Considerable, its uh, its uh, help would have been. Um, Andonis. Thank you, Alessandro, and congratulations for organizing this uh, conference, uh, this workshop, and many thanks to all of your team. It was uh, fascinating to see uh, work of such sophistication directed to to a structure of a period that uh, has, was once painted in gloomy terms. Now, my question uh, uh, regards um, uh, broader aspects and uh, uh, comparative aspects. Now, one of the concerns which made uh, Georg Kert uh, uh, take an alternative, uh, uh, propose an alternative reconstruction of the Tumba building was uh, the lack of comparisons from uh, throughout the early Iron Age. We, we, have, uh, we have, however, some evidence, both in terms of structures from the very end of the second millennium and also the eighth century. And uh, as you mentioned, you're already working on them. Uh, and then of course, there are the temple models of the eighth century. And as I was hearing, uh, uh, refreshing my mind on the discussion, I was thinking of how pointed the roof of the Nicolaica model is, for example, which um, may or may not be relevant here. So I wanted to, to invite you to share some uh, aspects of your own going more broader take on the topic and tell us uh, uh, if, you can get evidence from other monuments which minimizes the possibilities or helps narrow down the research you're conducting. Thanks, Adonis. Uh, very important point. Uh, the models, the uh, other 
evidence uh, from the same period or uh, earlier or later. Um, by the way, uh, touched roofs here and from the, um, from the Greek area, they're still uh, they're used today, or at least the Sarakatsani still uh, lived in the, the, those kinds of structures until uh, the, the 50s or 60s or, or even later in some areas. Uh, so yes, there is a lot of uh, both archaeological and ethnographical uh, material that we can uh, use as a point of comparison. Um, the models, the, the, the ancient votive, early Greek votive models, especially those that unquestionably uh, portray touched loose, those are probably the most eloquent. You mentioned the Nicolaica model. The Nicolaica model is one of the most ancient, uh, dating to probably dating to the last quarter of the 8th century BC, even before the first temple documented at the site. Uh, the, the, the pitch there, as far as I remember, is around 60 degrees or more. Uh, so uh, that, that's one of the reasons why we didn't want to lower the, the pitch. Uh, the, it would have been cheating in our ethics, uh, <laughs> structural engineering ethics. Um, uh, now, not all models are that uh, steep, as steep as the Nicolaic uh, uh, model. But other models are even steeper. For example, there's one in particular, there are several models, several early stone models from Samos that are even steeper. Some are over 70 degrees. Uh, and I, by, I mean uh, the, the angle uh, from the horizontal. Uh, so the, the, they all tend to be steep. Uh, the, the, the less steep, the shallowest is probably 40 degrees, a little less than the Tumba building. Uh, the, again, in the next iterations of our uh, structural wind and structural analysis, we will also use uh, wind data cor uh, so corresponding to 50 degrees. And we will use that, we bring that, import that into the SAP model, we will <coughs> make a, a structural a finite element analysis model of 50 degrees and we will see we will try to understand uh, what how the structural behavior changes with the pitch that might help us uh, understand why so many of the models are even steeper than uh, 45 degrees I don't know if this answers uh, uh, exhaustively enough to your question uh, thank you Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any more questions from the uh, panelists or from the, uh, the Q&A, the chat? Lena. Lena Landrino. You're muted, Lena. <laughs> Sorry. You're still muted. Thank you very much for this wonderful uh, opportunity to discuss this such an interesting uh, uh, topic. Um, I have some uh, questions. I, I am wondering, first, uh, of the shape of this external pose. For me, the dimension of stool and empty is such a thin uh, pose. Um, and I can explain this, I can understand when it's at the interior, as uh, um, the interior of the walls, um, supported from the walls, maybe. But I don't understand why the external pose, pose uh, should be so thin. Um, and also this shape to, to add the load of the roof, doesn't have the right, uh, right direction, I mean, the, the right direction of the dimensions. I would think that those very uh, load from the roof have dimension um, vertically to the a fracture. Do um, you understand what I mean? So, Unfortunately, the, uh, the sound is not very clear. I, 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 oh. Is if you if you could uh, repeat it in 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 in, uh, in summarize it uh, with okay. a better. 
Can you hear me better now? Yes. Thank you. Okay. So first of all, thank you for the opportunity to discuss uh, such an interesting topic. And I have some questions and I, I just, I will express my, my questions here. I don't know if you have any answer on that. Um, the shape of the external posts, um, which as I have read is six centimeters to 10 to 20. Um, I find them very narrow uh, to, in order to support the, the forces from a roof uh, coming down. Uh, <clears throat> I can understand the internal posts um, attaching on the walls uh, to be uh, narrow because they have the wall besides them. But the external posts to have such a narrow uh, dimension it's not logical. It's not technically, I think. It's not, they are not strong enough. Uh, they can be more flexible uh, if they have this dimension um, parallel to the building instead of having the long dimension uh, vertically to the building. Do, do you understand what I mean? Uh, uh, help me, uh, please uh, tell me if I am misinterpreting your, your question. But I think you're, you're talking about the cross section of the uh, external posts. Why are they so thin? And why, uh, as important, are they oriented longitudinally, which, it, which means uh, parallel to the longitudinal axis of this building? Now, uh, everyone who has uh, any acquaintance with the structural, the stiffness of a piece of wood or any structural component knows that if those posts had been turned at 90 degrees in plan, and I mean by this saying, if those posts had the, the cross section, uh, that uh, <coughs> rectangular, if you can see me here, the rectangular section uh, had been turned 90 degrees to be perpendicular to the long walls of the building, their effect in terms of adding to the stiffness of the building would have been uh, much greater. So yeah. I, I, that also puzzled me a lot. And uh, uh, I thought, yes, uh, the only thing that uh, turning the posts perpendicular to the wall, uh, and now I'm talking uh, particularly of, which by the way have the same orientation, uh, the only negative uh, effect of turning those posts, as you are suggesting, is that they would not have been able to transfer loads to the wall. What they, would have, what they would have done instead, they would have cut the adobe wall. Uh, uh, I'm, not talking, I'm not talking about the internal ones. I can understand why they are like that, but I'm talking about the external ones. So I'm okay. just wondering why they are not uh, rectangular, for instance, six to six, 10 to 10, or something like that, uh, or another dimension, why they have this uh, uh, dimension in, in in this direction so i'm just wondering maybe maybe i'm just continuing my thinking maybe um we don't have the continuation of the same roof at that area maybe we have a, a lighter covering at that at that area that corridor around or even an horizontal uh, um roofing there why, why we have to think that the, the roof is continuing until the external posts? Technically, yes. it's not very um, sufficiently uh, resolved, I think, uh, from the ancients, <laughs> if, if the if, roof was going outside so far. Uh, thank you. This is very, very interesting. Uh, now, again, why did we not, I did show one, in my, one of my images uh, a, a roof that had a shallower pitch over the veranda. Uh, I think that's entirely possible. But again, that's not the worst case scenario. The only thing, uh, the only reason we went with the most adverse conditions is that, again, we wanted to be uh, brave and embrace the adverse conditions. And if it, sure. didn't, if it hadn't worked, we would have resorted to something a little more friendly to the uh, uh, structural uh, analysis. Uh, well, I, I, I took it from uh, the uh, uh, wall posts because uh, starting with the wall posts helps me to arrive at a maybe a more a comprehensive answer to your question about the exterior posts. So 
Why were the exterior posts oriented as they were? Why were they, were they, they were basically blanks, right? So why? Exactly, exactly. Uh, maybe that, they were attached to another structure, we don't know. Plinths, or maybe something else was there that we don't have it anymore. Or was that unusual? Uh, I don't think that we can say that that was unusual. There's a number, an increasing number of other buildings that had planks instead of uh, squared or uh, 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 or circular cross sections. I will mention one: the, for example, the, uh, the early temple of Artemis Orthia at Sparta that had uh, planks that were uh, much as thick and large as the uh, the the, the uh, tumba buildings. But getting back to the, 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 the answer. So one of the great advantages, in my opinion, uh, based on, on what we have found to be uh, true structurally, of having the interior post, the wall posts, flat uh, planks uh, attached to the wall uh, long, uh, lengthwise, flatwise, rather than oriented at a 90 degree angle, which would have provided more stiffness to those posts, one of the great advantages is that maximizes the contact surface between those posts and the wall. In one of the takeaways from Liam's uh, finite element uh, analysis was that the wall was very important. So the mechanism that would have transferred the loads from the roof that possibly started to move under hurricane force winds or less, uh, the transfer of loads from the frame and the, the, the roof to the wall was really important. So probably, possibly, our interpretation at this stage is that uh, one of the reasons for that unusual uh, orientation of, of the wall posts was to, uh, uh, to provide the, the largest possible contact surface with the wall. And also, getting to your answer, sorry for being a little long, uh, because we also asked, uh, you know, one, one of the interesting aspects of the evidence is that there's a consistent alignment of wall posts and veranda and exterior posts. Uh, we asked, what does that mean? Is there any compelling reason for imagining what the evidence is suggesting, which is a direct structural horizontal connection between the two? And we found that uh, the more the looser the base joints became, the more that lateral brace would have been important. Now, coming to the point, to attach, uh, because most of the uh, because all of the uh, interior posts were planks, there are several considerations that could be put forward. One is that if you're using larger trunks and you're cutting them into planks. Uh, why not continue to do that and use planks for consideration uh, for, for the exterior uh, um, um, uh, posts? And also, uh, we, uh, I, we modeled several uh, possible types of connection between the wall posts and the exterior posts. And having the exterior posts oriented parallel, flatwise, parallel to the interior posts, uh, really helped. We found it that it would have helped with the creating a tight connection. Now, I didn't show you uh, our sketches, our preliminary investigations of this, but that's as far as uh, uh, an un our answer can go at this preliminary stage. But Lena, thank you. You raised some very important problems that have fueled the uh, internal debate in our team for a long time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but I have another question. Um, I'm looking at the section of uh, Houghton, of course, Houghton, um, and I see that the walls uh, do not have a foundation or the floor. If you see, I don't know if you have this section. I'm just wondering um, the structure because I would expect. Uh, the foundation of the walls to uh, continue and the floor should have been higher than what we see here, that the walls do not have foundations. They have the stone base, but this stone base does not penetrate the ground, as I see at the, 
at the drawing. And I know that Jake Coulton was very careful. Uh, so apparently this is what you found at the ex excavation. That shows, of course, either that we don't have all information or that we have a structure that was um, uh, not very careful or that we have a structure that uh, didn't follow any tradition because the, the technical tradition, you know, the construction of a wall is always, have, it has a base, a, a foundation under the ground that makes the walls more stable. So I don't know how to explain this. That's why I'm asking. Very <laughs> clear, answer. thank you. And it's, it's a question, uh, so you, you have both an archeological <laughs> and an architectural background. So those technical questions are really uh, what spices up this conversation. Uh, uh, I, I thank you for, for, for saying that. Now, I have to say that I, I uh, the, the, we, we know exactly that the building had no, what you call foundations. The, the situation is as, as faithfully as shown in the section. The excavations were meticulous. Uh, the ground is conglomerate. It was uh, more than uh, strong enough to support the building. And, and by the way, I have to say, that uh, it's not that the building did not follow a tradition, it was well within the tradition. Because uh, as you uh, I remember reading this in uh, Kera uh, Fagerstrom's uh, 1988 uh, uh, a book on the early Iron Age uh, uh, architecture, uh, his survey demonstrated that uh, buildings in Greece before the uh, until uh, the early archaic period, at least, they usually did not have foundations, especially if they were carried directly by uh, bedrock. So it is kind of normal. It is. It was kind of expected to uh, that the tumba building would not have any what we call foundations in the modern sense of the word. So it was fully following its uh, its own tradition. It's just that this tradition is not the classical tradition. It's something. Mm -hmm much uh, earlier than that. Mm -hmm. Is there Thank any you. more comments? Oh, I, I really appreciate your, your, your comments, uh, Lena, and I hope that we can uh, continue this conversation. Uh, is Me there too. any more question from our uh, panelists? If not, I will. I would uh, uh, take a look at the, the Q&A uh, uh, in, in the chat. Uh, Margot. I think also Alidas just uh, commented in the chat to Lena's point that um, these buildings also. Oh, yes. Oh, this is very interesting. A, a latest year, uh, Mitru, uh, the, our early Iron Age buildings at Mitru do not have foundations either. Oh, and our roof no, posts no. are not set in the ground, but they are set on stone bases at ground level. Now, I always, uh, a latest, I uh, always found this to be so interesting. Your, the, the Mitru uh, building is, is uh, that particular building is one of the very few examples of a building probably with a thatched building considering its uh, its shape it's a yes. end uh, which uh, had posts set on stone bases rather than uh, <laughs> set. that really impacts on the, the durability of the building Mm -hmm. Yes, they're set on very heavy stone bases, except for two stone bases, which are set next to the wall, which are much thinner, and the base is not as well cut, and we think they were like emergency bases because to, to um, strengthen a weak point in the building. Yeah. And, and our building is not set on bedrock or anything. It's set over the ruined earlier structures, which are... Um, you know, so basically on, on a disintegrated mud break of earlier structures. Um, and we have, even in the Bronze Age, we very seldom have foundations. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't seem to have been a consideration at the time. Thank you, ladies. Uh, Professor Hazel Berger, welcome. Again, my thanks for bringing us together. Uh, can, I, can you hear me? Yes. I have, at this point, uh, we are going into overtime, it seems, uh, just to two questions, one going directly to you, Professor Pieratini, uh, to whom I'm so grateful for having brought us together, the other one to our DE engineering colleagues. 
Um, the question number one is why was the low pitch um, solution that uh, you showed in your uh, image uh, in your images uh, not uh, not further considered and and excluded in a way without further discussion? Was there any reason to to uh, that this problem has been or this question or aspect has been resolved? Uh, that's the one. The question to the engineers, um, how can we develop a language that fits all of us, not just the architects, but also the archeologists, the engineers, the historians, so that we are not confronted with a wonderful flood of options and choices that made me feel a little bit like in being invited to a 20 course dinner and um, not really knowing where to start and what to do what to do with all this wonderful with under wonderful set of options and i recall that years ago it took me almost two months to develop a common language with just one of my engineering colleagues as for curvature so I think that that occasion here that um, made me aware that yes, we need more such things. We need the architects, the historians, the archeologists try to develop a common language, um, which even to me uh, as, an, as, an, as an trained architect and to, to some degree engineer, was difficult to follow all the arguments and the multiple choices that we have from the various assumptions of the engineers that we have to deal with when resolving a historical problem. And all of a sudden, the historian's questions became very, very important, such as, was this building built for, for a long time? And that goes, of course, way beyond engineering. And maybe we are running in one direction and uh, forgetting about a few other ones. In the essence, two questions. Why was one solution or, uh, um, 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 excluded? And the other question, how can we how can we develop how can we develop a successful common language which I see not yet fully accomplished uh, despite the wonderful event here. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Professor Hasenberger. Uh, uh, now quickly to uh, your first point, uh, it is not that we excluded the lower pitch. We okay. Did not. Good to hear. We did not. And uh, okay. uh, I, I really like your, your uh, analogy that the 20 course uh, dinner, this <laughs> is exactly my perception. This has been my, my the source of my uh, disorientation. And, you know, every time I, you know, I, I'm an architectural historian. And every time I would bring a problem to the attention of my learned uh, uh, colleagues, uh, engineers or uh, physicists, uh, I found out the problem to be, what I thought to be the problem, to be just the surface of the problem, not even enough to describe the surface of the problem. So you're touching a very sensitive point. We are just at the beginning of uh, uh, trying to imagine a, 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 a interdisciplinary uh, uh, language, if any such thing can exist. But what we can do is to start understanding each other by talking to each other, and this is what we have tried to do so far. Uh, again, we have not, th thank you, thank you. We have not excluded uh, uh, that, the lower pitch, we have not excluded uh, the oh, cross. You know. Thank you. It's just that uh, we, we found that the uh, Every time we have to choose between dessert and the pasta asciutta and the pasta alla carbonara, <laughs> <laughs> we, we had a choice to make. Yeah. And, uh, you know, sometimes it was boar, uh, the animal. Yeah. And that was much heavier, much more difficult to process for our stomach. That, that was what we call the, the worst case scenario. So we went for the boar. We went to, for the, 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 the most difficult uh, meal to process. And if we could withstand that food, then everything else was, was really much easier to process. In other words, 
having demonstrated that the higher pitch works means yeah. the lower and it's the break resolution, definitely. Definitely. Uh, uh, the soundness of Coulton's suggestion. He might uh, be enjoying. The question of how do, how do we, from now, how do we take it from now and develop and start uh, developing a, a more effective, I also believe we, we need to talk more, we need to develop a more effective way of talking to our, uh, our colleagues in, in complementary disciplines. But we also need to, in my opinion, and, and, Relevant to your point, perhaps, we also need to develop an approach that can make sense of all these variables that in, in, in a, unavoidably uh, spring up from everywhere. Um, uh, and at some point, when, when, when we start having to deal with hundreds of assumptions, now in this case, it wasn't hundreds, it was probably in the tens, which is, also, which is already a lot. But when we start dealing with a lot of uh, uh, parametric variations relative to many, many factors, tens of, fa of factors, then as Gina was, uh, was, was observing the other time, then it becomes, probably becomes a problem of probability rather than of certainty. And in the sciences, there's an approach called, of which I know very little, is, uh, help me, uh, that is called the Monte Carlo approach. Uh, we assess the probability of a certain, uh, uh, phenomenon that a certain phenomenon would have been as we describe it, as we imagine it, and it's a different approach. We uh, architects want to have certainty uh, that that building would stand alone. Yes, no. Uh, what is the probability? What does it mean for an architect? But perhaps that's a more interdisciplinary approach than uh, than even a worst case scenario. One quick question. Do you consider do you consider the Tumba building an outlier or an a a, a or a highlight? Uh, a highlight is in any case, uh, but an out outlying highlight or an exemplary highlight that we of course all wish to be part of the further development of the peripteral Greek temple. Do you uh, direct it? <laughs> that's a very good question. Don't know if I have an answer to that. Well, as the as the present record uh, archaeological record stands, it is an outlier, or at least uh, it, there are not many. I, I I wouldn't venture farther than that. <laughs> we will probably find uh, more buildings uh, uh, that long, that big, almost that long, almost that big, that big. If you refer in particular to the veranda, uh, I don't think it was an outlier at all. Because in the very same period, uh, around the middle of the 10th century BC, at Calapoli, not very far from there, and probably the elites from Lefkandi uh, sacrificed at Calapoli in that period, uh, and we know it for many reasons. Uh, there was the, 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 I believe, the fourth or fifth iteration of the South Temple at Calapoli. It was a very small building. Mm -hmm. uh, it was probably three meters wide by seven ish, and it had a uh, line of posts, just like in the veranda in the in the in the tumba building. Except the posts were circular in the, in cross section, and there, the distance from the walls was about fifty centimeters. So if you scale down the veranda building, it's pretty much the same uh, relationship. Uh, but of course, that we cannot call that a veranda because it was not did not create a, a usable space. Fifty centimeters from the wall—that's not a an antecedent to uh, the 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 peripteral layout. But where do we set the, the 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 threshold? Where do we set the? How do we discriminate? There were the same stru a similar structural component in a different scale. That spatially meant a different thing. But perhaps structurally, it was not too different from our Tumba building. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Paul, I see uh, your hand. Yes, just to, to toss this out, a possible explanation as to why you might want to go for a steeper pitch is because of the nature of thatch. And that the, the steeper the pitch, the more water resistant it is. Um, my, Younger daughter and her husband live and work in Vietnam. And pre-COVID, we uh, took 
spent a family Christmas there. And there's a wonderful museum, open air museum in Hanoi showing uh, regional architecture from around Vietnam. And they had local people come to Hanoi and build structures in the traditional manner. What really struck me, that, well, it didn't strike me as a surprise that thatch was such a popular medium for roofs, but that the pitch, I, you know, I didn't measure it, but just by eyeballing, the pitch was at about 60 degrees on these. And now Vietnam is not quite monsoon, but rainy season is truly rainy season. And what my explanation to myself was, is that's why you wanted that pitch. You know, the more you have the water coming down, the less it's going to be. So it, it may be that that's why you want to look for a steeper pitch with that. Uh, Paul, thank you. This, uh, I, um, my understanding of uh, thatch roofing is consistent, totally agrees with what you're, 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 you were saying. Uh, as a matter of fact, the uh, uh, performance and the durability, the water proof performance and the durability of a thatch coat is a function of two factors, mainly, not only, but mainly two factors. One is the thickness of the coat and two is the pitch. And those two things happen to be tightly related to each other. Now, it has to be very steep because the coat is made up of bundles of uh, uh, straw or layers of reeds. And those layer of reeds overlap significantly with the, the lower ones. That means that the angle at which each bundle or layer of reeds is laid is much shallower than the pitch of the roof. So in order to have at least 20 degrees, which is considered the minimum for water to be, not to be sucked by the, the stems of straw or the reeds, uh, then for, for that to be 20 degrees, that means that the angle of the, the roof, the pitch of the roof has to be at least 40, 45 degrees. Um, thank you, uh, Paul. And there was a, uh, um, so I apologize with my, uh, to my um, engineer colleagues. Uh, well, half of uh, uh, Professor Hasenberger's question was for the engineers, and I, have, I ended up taking the you know, responsibility for the whole answer. So uh, please, anytime, if you have anything to, you would like to add, please chime in. There was another question from uh, Paolo Vitti. Yes. Uh, thank you, Alessandro. As you see, uh, half a day is not sufficient. Can you please come closer? I don't know if the uh, owl we, can. They hear me. Do you hear me from the audience? Yeah, okay. Great. Uh, so thank you, Alessandro. Thank you to all the attendees and panelists. Uh, Alessandro, it's not sufficient half a day. Uh, we have to uh, see that uh, time is running and uh, many, many points are coming out. Uh, I, I would like to thank, first of all, uh, the colleagues engineers for their contribution. Uh, as you can see, uh, your work has raised uh, a lot of thoughts on architectural and archaeological matters. So this is the kind of conversation. I mean, uh, uh, your discussion sometimes is extremely technical to our understanding, and our discussions are too philological for your understanding. But then at a some point, all this comes together. And what, what I think, what my very brief observation, is that we, we start from the principle that uh, ancient buildings we analyzed had already reached a maximum level of perfection. So we, we tend to, to, uh, to look at them as accomplished models of architecture. Um, what can, can come out from your analysis is that indeed uh, some buildings could be into a process. So what you identify actually are weaknesses which can be addressed at a later stage of, uh, let's say, progress development of a model. So it doesn't mean that the building we are analyzing had to reach the highest level of perfection in adopting that kind of technique, but could be inside a process. So by the questions and the problems you come out with your analysis, we can identify maybe the process and not the accomplished model. 
this is my my only observation. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. And that is very uh, opens up a lot of uh, uh, possible avenues of inquiry. Uh, we should continue this conversation. And I totally agree that half a day, as it turns out, is not enough to resolve all of these uh, uh, and answer all of these questions that we we we, we uh, uh, raised. Uh, so I, I would be happy to continue the conversation at a later uh, 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 time, uh, maybe somewhere else, maybe with uh, more of you in person. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I'm very truly grateful to this uh, uh, collaboration of all my colleagues here and to the, uh, the, the, the insights that you, all of you uh, panelists were able to, to give us. Is there any, any, are there any more questions in the Q and A yeah. or in the chat? Yeah. Okay. There are or there aren't? There are. Okay, could we read some um, of them? I take probably a couple more. It's, it's yes. coming late. Uh, okay. So, uh, let's see. Uh, can you possibly address this? The Why the cross-section of the wind model um, was where the, the posts were excluded? Okay, I think we already answered yep. that. Uh, the the that's a good question actually. The the po the in the the, the the physical model that we used in the we put in the wind tunnel was simplified because the with the wind uh, tunnel we were looking at the macro phenomenon. The reason for using experiments or using models into the putting models into the wind tunnel was for the uh, numerical study to be able to uh, have some uh, uh, basic data. We, we, we had, it had to be validated with that, some macro uh, uh, basic uh, uh, information that we, know, we knew to be true because it was experimental. But then the experimental data could not be very, very accurate to the details for many practical reasons. It would, have, it would not have led to reliable uh, outcomes. Whereas the numerical uh, 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 study was much more accurate, but not necessarily reliable until it was validated with the macro information. So that, that's why the, the, the details were all in the numerical uh, model. Mm -hmm. Let's take another one. And then, uh, so Paul asked this question about um, the eaves and the socket, but I think we yes, we already it, yeah. took that. Um, and the uh, Nancy Klein asked, uh, "Does a solid three D printed model with such a deep overhanging overhanging okay. socket?" We, we, I think we I think this um, uh, this was so addressed. Uh, Nancy, please correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. We just addressed it. Thanks for um, making the point. Yes, and that's fine. And then, uh, okay, we also yep. discussed that. Yes, we, oh, yes well. we took. Okay, we're making sure we're not uh, overlooking any of your uh, uh -huh. precious uh, uh, feedback. So, Richard Economakis okay. asked um, uh, the loft. Jake Holton, yeah. Yes. The loft. Well, yeah. yes, that, that, is, that relates to the cross uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, beams. Mm -hmm. uh, if there were cross beams, there could have been a second story. Uh, um, some scholars have justly pointed out that the models like the, the Argo, the early archaic, late geometric, early archaic model from uh, the uh, Erion, uh, from Argos, uh, that suggests uh, a, a second story. But others, uh, like Schattner, observed that that model, the, the way it's, it's constructed, that it could just be the result of it being made up of blades of terracotta. So we don't know, but that's a very, very interesting point. Mm -hmm. So uh, now it's uh, one, uh, almost mm -hmm. one thirty. I'm afraid we will have to uh, close the works. Uh, and uh, I would uh, like to come to the podium. And uh, uh, so I had some, I want to make sure I, I'm not forgetting to thank any of the people who's invaluable uh, Help has allowed us to, to perform our tests, to make sense of them. And so uh, my gratitude goes first and foremost to the University of Notre Dame for funding this project and making it all possible. 
to our School of Architecture and College of Engineering and their respective deans, Stefanos Polizoides and Patricia Colligan, for fostering our interdisciplinary work. To all of our speakers, uh, um, to all of our speakers, members of Ishala, with particular thanks to Liam Abu Jabdeh for uh, his tireless work in finishing the structural analysis in time for this event while he was juggling many things, including his uh, important finals. I hope that they went well. But a round of applause. Thank you. Um, um, my gratitude goes to Professor Irene Limos for her participation in this colloquium and for the continued support to my research before this project, to this project, and I really hope that we, uh, we're up to your expectations. I really hope that this uh, can become a, a, a years long collaboration. I'm truly grateful for your presence, your, all of your feedback. And a deep thanks to our remote panelists for their invaluable feedback. Uh, and our uh, thanks to Kate Smith, Peter, Peter Liddle, and the British School of Athens, and to Matthew Harpster and the Maritime Archaeology Interest Group of the uh, Archaeological Institute of America for promoting this event through their mailing list. Uh, to our audience, both in person and remote, to our staff at the School of Architecture, and finally to Margot Holbert. Uh, Margot, will you please stand up? Uh, thank you for their invaluable help in organizing this event. Thank you, Margot. And I remind our audience that uh, a recording of this colloquium will soon be made available on the website of the School of Architecture of Notre Dame. So I really uh, would like to express my deepest, sincerest gratitude to all of you, and I really hope this can become a continuous conversation and we other further events here, there, everywhere. <laughs> and I, I really thank you again for your, uh, your, your feedback. Thank you. Thank you very much.